Good evening, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we have all councillors present. That's uh, Mayor Granikowski, Councillors Portalon, Bumgarter, Franco, Heed, Melendez, Obrey, <coughs> Parker, and Zipiri. Oh, and you. Thank you. Um, so to start our Tuesday, January 7 town council meeting, if we could please rise to salute the flag. And we have the pleasure of having our legislative delegation here this evening. So I would ask Senator Summers, Representative Conley, and Representative Dela Cruz to lead us in the salute to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Thank you. I don't believe we have any recognitions, awards, and memorials this evening. Uh, we have no public hearing, so we are down to uh, Roman numeral five, receipt of citizens' petitions, comments, and concerns. This is the portion of the council meeting where the council welcomes comments from citizens. To address the council, please sign the sheet on the table, which I have in front of me. Um, when you are recognized, please approach the podium, clearly state your name and address, and speak into the microphone. Each presentation should be limited to five minutes or less, and citizens should, if possible, submit written comments. Presentations should be related to matters pertinent to Groton. Town councilors will only ask questions in order to clarify the speaker's presentation and can respond during the response to citizens' petition portion of the meeting. And we have um, several people signed up to speak this evening. We have Chase Foster, followed by Eric Osman. Hi, uh, my name is Chase Foster. I live at uh, 72 Baker Avenue. Um, also a member of the RTM District 3. I'm here to speak on behalf of the uh, plastic ban ordinance. Um, I reached out over the last couple weeks to um, several local restaurants, business owners, um, and they expressed some concerns in terms of uh, uh, not being aware of the ordinance and, and not have, having seen it. And uh, the way that the, the definition of polystyrene and uh, whether or not that actually applies to solid polystyrene, because that would impact uh, you know, a lot of things, including uh, coffee lids um, and the uh, condiment containers. Um, and so I'd, um, I just was here to speak on their behalf and uh, ask that uh, the language might clear any ambiguity um, so that they know that it's only intended for foam products instead of the, the solid products. Um, and that's. Keep it short, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Um, Eric Osman, followed by Ashley Couteau Toole. Hi, I'm Eric Osman, um, 125. Oh. oh, okay. Can you still hear me? Okay. Still coming through the, okay. Still coming through the speakers, okay, good. <laughs> okay, Eric Osman, 125 Eastwood. I'm also a member of the RTM as well. I'm also addressing the ordinance of Article 7, uh, single use of plastic and uh, polystyrene regulations. Uh, as a town of uh, Tegraton, as a, as a town representative of Tegraton, uh, it has been brought to my attention of the, uh, of the proposed ordinance regarding the single use in polystyrene that will affect food, food service establishments. Reading through the ordinance, I have many concerns on how this will affect the food services businesses across Groton and what sort of financial burden uh, these establishments will have to consume uh, because of the ordinance. I can only assume that the writers and supporters of, of this ordinance did not take this into consideration. However, for, upon further investigation, I have found, uh, I find it to be absolutely appalling that those who are responsible for orchestrating this ordinance did not communicate the draft to most places of business regarding food services. Upon my findings, I personally contacted 30 different food establishments throughout Groton Town and Mystic. Out of the 30 establishments I contacted, 15 establishments were to totally unaware of the ordinance draft. I would like to 
set the record straight that some of the food services that I contacted are in fact franchise restaurants. The other food services had somewhat of an idea of the ordinance, what the ordinance entails. However, we're not clear on the in-depth ordinance upon my findings. In addition to some of the RTM co of my RTM colleagues and I, I also found one major chain restaurant cannot accommodate this to this ordinance and cannot offer a polystyrene alternative through the cor their corporation, distrib corporation distribution, thus roughly impacting an estimate, and you know, this, this there came from the manager, this is not uh, a made up figure, but a half a million dollars of total lost revenues per year on one product line. This, total is, this is totally unacceptable and shows the contradictive status that, from the town that claims that we're business friendly. The request of, of some RTM colleagues and myself, we recommend that this draft is revised accordingly to meet the needs of the food establishments and there's a fair compromise. The way the draft is currently written is confusing, not clear, and does not define the achievements that we're trying to be met. Also, I would like to be, be I also, there should be more research done to the financial impact that this is gonna cost food services if the ordinance is passed through council and also the RTM. In addition to the open dialogue from town officials to each one of the food services across the Groton and the ordinances as an ordinance is being formulated. Thank you. Ashley Couteau Tool followed by Jane Couteau. Ashley Kuto Tool, 113 Whitaker Drive in Stonington. Um, I know I've spoken um, before you guys on a couple of occasions now, and you guys obviously know my stance on the plastic ordinance ban um, and the effect it's going to have on our business operations at Dunkin' Donuts. I think that it is clear that a lot of the businesses in the town did not know. We only knew about this through a friend who was involved in town politics, and we were never alerted, and we have five locations in the town of Groton. Um, I would like to just point out um, that recently um, Forbes just listed the state of Connecticut as number 43 for the best state to do business with. We are already eighth from the bottom. Connecticut has a 10% higher cost of doing business than the national average. We lost 8,000 people who migrated out of the state of Connecticut. We're number 45th in business cost, number 31 in labor supply, in Forbes quote said, regulatory climate and fiscal health rank among the worst in the nation for Connecticut. We're number 43rd in regulatory environment. We're number 49 in states for entrepreneurs. They said due to the business taxes and declining working age population, basically don't go to Connecticut. We already have, we're already struggling in this state and I'm just asking that you guys as the town councilors of Groton to do what you can to help mitigate things for businesses in this state. Do what you can at a local level to do the best you can to not make it harder for us in a state that's basically already impossible to do business in. Um, I would like to thank Councilwoman Parker for responding to our email um, and acknowledging that. And I'd also like to thank Councilwoman um, Franco and Obrey for taking the time to listen to us and our concerns and really trying to help us understand this and what can be done so that this ordinance doesn't have such a negative impact on business. Thank you. Jane Kutu followed by Roseanne Katowski. Jane Kutu, 106 Forba Chronic Road, Groton, Connecticut. Um, I want to first say I am anything but a public speaker. I don't <laughs> feel comfortable up here, but I had to bring myself up here because at the last meeting I was at, I was appalled at what I witnessed and cannot believe that this is the way things are done in town, you know, in the town of Groton. I felt like I was at a circus. People were laughing and joking, coming up here from all other towns. How many people up here were from Groton? Does anybody take into account that people should not be up here stating facts, a lot of them that weren't true? It's so personable, the feeling that I got. Like, 
this friend was here for this friend. It was very childish, and I felt it to be so unprofessional. And like she said, I don't know what is going on in Connecticut, but in Groton, do you really want to go this far? I want to save everything, the earth, and I have grandchildren, but I just feel like sometimes you're doing this because you can, because you're in a town and you have the ability to do that to a small business owner like me. But instead of going after the big people who you know, put meats in styrofoam, I feel like you're picking on me because you can. And I want to thank you for taking time out for, you know, we wrote a long thought out email and I got one response. I was, I just, I'm not comfortable here. And I got five businesses. And I think it's really sad. Thank you. Roseanne Katowski followed by Liz Raceback. Good evening, Roseanne Katowski, 24 Ann Avenue, RTM District 5. After attending the workshop and the public hearing on the proposed Town of Groton Plastic Ordinance on the agenda tonight, I still do not support it. Here are a few reasons why. As I stated at the workshop and public hearing, I believe this ordinance is government overreach. I know that I'm doing everything I can to recycle, and I'm sure that everyone in this room is as well. What's next? Banning people from buying coffee cups and stirs. Where does government overreach stop? The Town of Groton Ordinance banning single-use plastics is not equitable. Why? Because the City of Groton and Groton Long Point are not covered in the ordinance. Last I checked, both are part of the Town of Groton. Does the Town of Groton really believe that it is equitable to place this additional cost on selective businesses in the Town of Groton, but not the City of Groton or Groton Long Point? During both the presentation and the public hearing, we heard that switching from a styrofoam cup to a paper cup will cost a Dunkin' Donut franchise, o franchise owner seven cents per cup. Why would the town of Groton place more financial burden on local business businesses? A couple more points I would like to bring up. China, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Thailand and Vietnam are dumping more plastic into the oceans than the rest of the world. About 90% of the planet's plastic pollution comes from a few rivers in Asia and Africa. I believe this ordinance is a feel-good ordinance, which will provide few actual results. The best thing the town of Groton can do for the environment is to pick up the litter in and on the sides of the streets and roads in town. There are some areas of town so disgustingly littered it looks like a third world country. If all property owners took responsibility for keeping their properties free from litter, as well as properties across the street if vacant, that would be proactive with actual results. I understand that the plastics ordinance is going to pass tonight, but I do not think that it should. Thank you. Liz Raceback. Good evening, members of the, of the town council. My name is Elizabeth Raisbeck. I live at 81 Main Street. And um, I wrote a nice short little thank you for the work you have done on this ordinance. Uh, this is not an arbitrary, capricious, sudden thing that you have done. This is an ordinance that you have given great thought to tremendous research by your staff. You have looked at what the other towns in Groton in Connecticut are doing. At least 20 uh, towns in Groton have passed single-use plastic bans in their towns. This is the way the world is going. It is not arbitrary. and. It's for incredibly important reasons. We are drowning in plastics in this world. Long Island Sound is getting millions of pounds of plastic dumped into it every year. We can take care of our little part of the world. Um, I believe the Conservation Commission will address the economics of this issue, but I just want to strongly commend you for the work you have done since starting last March. 
and how carefully you have thought about this. Um, I do have a suggestion that considering the number of people interested in this issue, you might move it up in the agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the list um, is the clerk will be reading the letter we all received from uh, Mr. Joseph LaBianca from 1 Fort Hill Road in Groton, Connecticut, please. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, um, my introduction, my name is Joseph LaBianca, and I have been in the McDonald's franchise at 561 Long Hill Road for the last 18 years. I'm reaching out in regards to the draft plastic ban ordinance, which I was made aware of just recently. I also understand this is a voting issue at tonight's town council meeting. While I support the, and applaud the effort to reduce the amount of plastic going into the waste stream, I have extreme concern with the current language of draft ordinance, specifically the definition of polystyrene. Due to the current ambiguity of the language, it's not clear if this is intended only for foams or also solid polystyrene. The language is, as stated, by excluding cutlery from the list of products could indicate that it also includes solid forms of polystyrene, including any plastic with the recycled number six and PS. This could include many products, such as the not limited to our coffee lids to be banned. Our distributor care, uh, current uh, center currently has no alter, uh, alternatives for solid number six or PS lids, which means all of our coffee lids could be banned with no alternative. If the intent to the ordinance is only to ban foam products, it's requested to amend the, the text to remove the ambiguity to potential misinterpretation. I encourage all of you uh, to be both thoughtful and thorough as these decisions could have serious negative impacts to our local business owners and the customers we serve in the community. Thank you for your time and attention. Today, correct? Correct. Thank you. Kristen Distanti, followed by Larry Dunn. Good evening. I'm Kristen Distante, 82 Irving Street in Mystic. And I just want to thank you again for um, you know, all the effort and thought and care that has gone into this ordinance. Um, just maybe briefly reviewing for some of the people in the room who are just showing up tonight for the first time. We've worked on this for over two years. We did extensive research. We looked at ordinances, uh, what was and was not working all over the country. Um, we surveyed, we had I think at least four articles in the day. We had a public information forum. We did a public survey that was available online and, and manually. Um, I personally spoke to 40 businesses. We made, we really, as we drafted or helped work on uh, the plan for the ordinance, we made a very big effort to try and reach out and make sure that business voices were heard from. That was a, a conscious effort on the part of the Conservation Commission. And I know you saw my slides a few times, but, but one of the results we got back from our surveys was that 85 to 90 percent of people, communities, uh, people and businesses in this town favor this ordinance. This is what the people want. The people of Groton want this. Um, and I just want to kind of go, go a little bit back to uh, I've, I've gone to McDonald's since 1960. Okay, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of Big Macs. That's a lot of Cokes. That's a lot of containers. Uh, I've been to Dunkin' Donuts for probably 20 to 30 years. You know, I, we have given, we have all, I, I, I challenge anyone in this room that, who has not been to McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts. We, give, we have given them the business, and those are just examples of bigger um, companies that, ha that seem to have some issue with this. We've given you our business all this time. It's your turn. Corporations, step up. Be responsible. This is something we have to do for our planet, for our future, for our oceans, for our children. Uh, this is something that we have to do, and it's happening all over the world. Someone mentioned Thailand. Effective January 1st, Thailand just banned single-use plastic. These other countries, India, Thailand, these other countries that are kind of the bad actors in this sphere, they're changing. They're changing their laws. Like, we don't want to be behind them. Uh, so, you know, I just think that the right thing to do is to, to continue moving forward in the right direction. It's not always easy to do the right thing, but we have to do the right thing. And just, just a quick Google search on my part, right before this meeting, uh, I was looking for um, compostable lids, because that seems to be a big issue, the lids. Twelve things popped up right away. Maybe a little more costly. I've spoken to downtown merchants, uh, Dan Miser at the Oyster Club, uh, the owner of Manana's, and they, they've said, look, 
we're doing this. It costs us a little more, but it's the right thing, and we have to do it. So, you know, appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Larry Dunn. Good evening. Larry Dunn, 91 Crosswinds Drive, and uh, I'm also the vice chair of the Conservation Commission. So I want to talk a little bit about and kind of support what the what was uh, Kristen just said, but on the, the business and economic side. Uh, so, you know, taking off from the survey that was done, uh, <clears throat> the number of uh, business owners that we, sur we surveyed, about 63% indicated that they completely are com completely committed to the reduction, reduction of single-use plastic. So that was, you know, from the business side, and she talked to the, uh, uh, the community side. I will point out a, a couple of uh, the facts that I heard that, yes, a lot of the plastic in the ocean is, is being put into the ocean uh, by uh, countries in Asia. I should point out that 70% of the plastic is produced by U.S. companies. So we are creating it, and the fact that we market our stuff overseas and allow it to come back, we still are kind of the owners of this problem. So that's, that's one aspect I wanted to, uh, to kind of point out. Uh, it, it, it is sourced in the U.S. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is I did some uh, reviews of the economics of the single-use plastics, and I will point out that for the most part, uh, 70, 80 percent, depending on the type of plastic it is, is sub we are sub the Groton taxpayers subsidizing the companies and the businesses in the town because of the litter pickup, because of the trash you know, the, the incineration uh, that we have to pay for. So when you look at all the cost of the life cycle of the plastics, the businesses right now are only funding 5 10%. Now, when you start to change to in more environmentally friendly uh, items like um, uh, paper and or other things, the gap closes. We still wind up subsidizing it, but it's now at a smaller amount. So I think you've got to look at both sides of who's, who's really benefiting or, or do, doing the true cost. My view is, you know, approach it like Germany does, which it says if you come out with a product and that cost of product that you sell to the consumer, 100 percent of the total life cycle cost must be in the price of the product. So all the reclamation, the reuse and recycling costs are in the price of the product going out, and it's not then done by the tax. Now, the taxpayer does it because they buy the product. Don't get me wrong. But you know, that's how they're going. And what's happening is they're taking stuff out of their packaging. They're reducing all that. And you know, if you've been to Europe, it's a lot cleaner than it is in some of the places around here because of that. Uh, to get more specific, um, you know, straws and lids, I think, were the two ones that were mentioned the most. Um, straw, the impact is something like about a, a penny per straw difference. Um, and when you look at, and I did look at the Dunkin' Donuts website, so the average store uses about 154,000 straws with hot and cold drinks. You kind of work it through. There is an impact of about $780 a year to the business. It's about 0.25% impact to the cost of a cold drink. And my view is, is that as a citizen, you know, would I pay for that? Yeah, because I, my taxes on the other side go down by more than that, right? Because I don't have to pay for picking up uh, these items because they don't, the plastic doesn't degrade. On the lids, a little more complicated because we got, and I do agree that there should be a, a clarification on the definitions of the polystyrene because there's different kinds of polystyrene. I think uh, the foam and the expandable one, I think we're all, and pretty much, I'm talking from the commission's point of view, we're all in agreement that that is the prime thing to eliminate. It takes out the, it has actually the most studies have shown they have about 20, 30 percent of the volume of waste is this non compressible foam stuff, right? All that packaging and the peanuts and all that stuff. So that's actually the worst. It also breaks down the fastest in terms of little itty bitty microparticles. It never really breaks down, but it kind of gets into our system and into our bodies quicker because of the way it is. The extrusion and the minute, hard sir. lids. And, and I'll, I'll just uh, end there. So I think uh, when you look at that, there is a three cent increase in cost on those lids when you go to a, a paper or a, uh, uh, another type of lid. And that, that does have an impact about, my estimate, about $4,500 per 
uh, store uh, for a like a McDonald's. So there, there is a little bit of money uh, there, certainly more than the straw one. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. And that's everyone who's signed up to speak. Is there anyone else? I saw some people just come in. If you'd like to come to the podium, please just state your name and address for the record. Come on up. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is Zell Stever, 81 Main Street. Um, I've come before you to speak on behalf of, uh, I think, a process that has uh, been very carefully and very well carried out uh, with the public. Um, I'm a little bit concerned when uh, members of our RTM come at the last meeting um, to uh, raise some objections when there's been more than ample opportunity for uh, public comment and public remarks uh, and concerns raised. Um, I would have to say to you that I think you've done a really splendid job in educating the public about what it is you're trying to do and you have uh, asked your uh, Conservation Commission to do a terrific job in collecting all that data. Now I will point out to you that it is not a big deal to bring your little bag to uh, the store to put your groceries in. It fits in your pocket. As you can see, I can just wrap this up and carry it in my back pocket. And I also would point out that there seems to be a concern tonight over the issue of uh, containers. And while it's taken me some time to figure out how to do this, um, there are containers like this stainless steel one I'm holding up with, of course, a plastic top to it. But it's something I reuse over and over again. And it does take time to figure out how to do this because I have to wash it out and have to bring it in the car every time I go. But there is an economic benefit for me for using this thing. And while this cup costs a couple of bucks, every time I go to Starbucks, as a one example, I get to get 10 cent off my cup of coffee. And so in very short order, I end up paying for this cup and uh, we, we then generate just one less plastic lid in one cup. And so I would be careful about uh, trying to uh, delay this ordinance at this point in time. Uh, if it turns out that there are problems, uh, you have ample opportunity going forward uh, to make some modifications and hopefully you would because uh, I'm sure we haven't covered everything in the universe with this sort of thing. Um, uh, some of the things that Mr. Dunn brought up, life cycle management of plastics, um, is very important. And it's not a, exactly a simple, uh, a simple matter because you're dealing with fossil fuels on, on the front end, you're dealing with fossil fuels in terms of either burning or disposing of these on the, on the other end. And it's a very complicated uh, equation, but basically the bottom line is that when you have to do that in a public sort of way, the taxpayer ends up paying for it. And so I would encourage you to pass this ordinance tonight. Um, I think you've done a really good job. And I would ask those people who have come late to this process to pay attention to what is uh, the process of government in this community. I think you've got a, a, a very good process in place. There's been ample opportunity for people to come and work this out. And uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stever. And that is everyone. Okay, very good. Um, so we are on to Roman numeral six, responses to citizens' petitions, comments, and concerns. Okay. We have Councilor Zapari, Councilor Bordelon, Councilor Overy. Please start. I, uh, I have to uh, comment to Mr. Foster and Mr. Osman that I was pretty much in sympathy with you when this process began. I was very skeptical about this process and concerned about the effect on local business and business in general. However, I, as we've gone through it, I've learned a great deal, and, I, and I'm sorry that you weren't here for that. But what we've learned is that our present use of plastics as we are doing it are, uh, uh, are resulting in a tremendous contamination of our oceans. Mm -hmm. uh, the plastics form islands in the ocean, and there's an island, uh, the collections are called islands. They collect, and there's a collection in the Pacific Ocean the size of uh, Texas. Even commercial shipping avoids those areas because they foul the, 
the equipment, the, the, the screw mechanisms for the ships to propel themselves. They, uh, the, there's a lot of sea life that's been destroyed by our pollution of the water with this material. Uh, and we've learned that the material does break down, so particulate uh, micro particles uh, wind up in our food stream and wind up inside our bodies. And we're not sure just what kind of harm they'll do to us. I think that this, this ordinance is only scratching the surface. We have to go further beyond this. Uh, but it is long time coming. We have to care for our environment. We have to care for the not only ourselves, but the other species that live on this planet. Uh, and if we don't, we're going to lose it. And we see that with the contamination of the atmosphere, and we see it also now with the plastic contamination in the ocean. So this is a step that we're trying to take. We're here where the rubber meets the road in Groton. We deal more directly with the people of Groton than any other government agency. We're your government. And we're trying to take some leadership in this. If every other town, especially every other coastal town in the country, does this sort of thing, we can make a dent in the process. Now, as far as China and Vietnam and uh, Korea and all of the eastern co countries, uh, the island countries in the uh, western uh, Pacific, or I, yeah, that would be the Western Pacific, as far as we're concerned, are concerned. We have no control over them. We can assert some, I hope our, our government is working diplomatically to try to influence their leadership to take these measures as well. So admittedly, the burden comes on to some business holders more than on the rest of the population. But it's, it's important that we do this, and the business owners, are, are going to have to, every once in a while, someone's ox is being gored. Uh, I don't feel too sorry for the coffee merchants who are selling coffee for two and a half dollars a cup, uh, which probably represents about, I don't know, maybe a thousand percent profit. So if they get another seven percent off of that, uh, uh, I, I feel bad, but uh, it's not my main concern. Thank you. Councillor Vordelon and Obrey. Um, yes. Uh, I just first want to thank everybody <coughs> that spoke tonight for coming out and voicing your concern. Despite what your feelings are or decisions, it's important that you do come out and speak about it. And um, I think it's important that you have a right to be here and your voice is heard. Um, with that being, say, being said, I understand that change in any form is hard. Um, if you look at how we've evolved in this country, um, I don't even have to throw in any analogies. We can only imagine where I could go with that. Um, we got to start somewhere. It has to change. The cost of an individual item, we look at the cost on the, on the merchant, but we, we're not talking about the cost on one's health and life. When you look at the styrofoam containers that are porous, that aren't the hard styrofoam, you know, the amount of uh, things that are leached from that into your coffee or your plate, that styrofoam plate that you're scraping off of, that cost, we need to talk about the cost of one's health, life. We're talking about the animals and the sea and all of that, but let's take a look at ourselves and what we're doing to ourselves with having these products around. Before all this stuff was even around, we, we made do. We did without this stuff. We had paper straws. I remember drinking out of them as a kid, and my brother throwing them and bending them, and you know, we, we, we did it, and we, we found a way. And as we've evolved, we found a way to make this, we thought, miracle uh, product that was gonna save us, and now we're finding out that it's not. And now we have to redirect our sales and figure out how do we help not only our businesses, but help the health of all of our constituents and friends and family in this town. So as change is not easy, one has to remember, think of the struggles of, of a lot of things in our culture of how we got to where we are. And it didn't come easy without a fight and people speaking up and saying, we must do this for the safety and well-being of all. So with that, I just want to say once again, I appreciate the people that came out to support. Some of the comments in reference to the fact that the due diligence wasn't done or the effort was not given to this. Right or wrong with any ordinance that is you know, constructed, there's time 
um, from our local um, staff that have worked on that. If it goes through or not, there's time, meetings, and a process. No ordinance is perfect, and if you can find one, please let me see it. This one, I'm sure, is going to have its glitches, but we have to have something. We need a platform to start from. I think this is a great diving board. I do agree that this could maybe have some tweaking in the sense of uh, maybe talking about exactly what type of styrofoam we're looking at. I think that's fair, how that would look and how we go forward with that to strike that section and, and redo that. I think that I can support that, and I think that we should. It should be more clear. But I want to uh, want people to understand that as Mr. Uh, Representative um, Counselor, sorry, uh, Zapiri stated, um, we are going to go further. I mean, we have to change our ways for, for the, sa the safety and well-being of our country. Um, and it, I just can't stress that enough. So once again, thanks for all the comments, and, but I, I feel that time and effort has been put into this. And um, as far as the businesses, I'm, I do direct to the town manager. I know there's nobody from that department here today. But looking at maybe that communication part on how we communicate with our businesses, maybe a database or something. So I will take some notes. I took some notes here. Coming up with a plan of how we um, maybe send mailers out to all of our businesses, have them on a list, and um, a little bit more. I mean, not everybody reads the paper, and some of the business owners just don't live in the town. So I, I can agree that maybe we can maybe find another way to communicate in the future. So maybe adding some of that on there would be acceptable and something that I would like to look into. So how, how, how are we gathering our information from our businesses? What type of database are we using? And what type of mailing system to make sure that we send something out in future as other things come down the pipeline? Um, but thank you again. We have Councilor Overy, Heed, and Bumgardner. Well, <laughs> lots been said. Uh, I feel very badly uh, about the conflict that we're running into with this. And I wanted to apologize to the people that aren't here now, though, uh, if we were less than professional in our conversations about it. Um, I, for one, try to be friendly with everybody that's coming in, whether I agree with them or don't agree with them. I still want to say hello and how are you? Um, this is difficult. It's difficult for us. We've agonized over it. We've talked about it a lot. And I got to tell you, I get opposition about this at home. So that makes it even harder. But I, I truly feel that we have to take a step. But then I think we have to be, as good counselors, we have to stay up on what is happening with it and what is not happening with it. So that if adjustments have to be made, we can make those adjustments. We can't just pass it and say, OK, now that's done. It, this is too big a project too big a step and um, so I hope that we can work together on this I'm very torn uh, uh, but I, I hope that we do uh, I hope we certainly seem to be approaching this in a professional manner and uh, I thank all of you that came out and I guess maybe the one thing I might say is in the future if there's something going on if each one of us just talked to two of our neighbors everybody would know what was going on. Thank you. Councilor Heaton Baumgartner. Uh, so first of all, thank you everyone who came out to speak today. Um, I guess I, I'd start by uh, going back to um, when we started the process. We didn't really know where to begin. We knew that there was a, a problem with plastics and um, you can see it on the streets. Um, but then you, when you start digging into it, you find all kinds of things uh, related to the cost of disposal and. Uh, so even when properly disposed, uh, there are uh, growing costs. Um, and looking at the international situation with fewer uh, places to recycle your products, uh, a lot of this is going to come back to us and you'll see uh, increasing costs in disposing your, uh, your curbside trash in, in the future, unfortunately. Um, so we didn't really intend to do anything that would create undue hardship on businesses. So uh, with a, you know, we gave it to the um, Conservation Commission. They basically led the charge on this. They did a lot of research. Uh, they came back and told us uh, where the real problems were and how to approach it. And um, you know, for that, you know, we're we're indebted to you. Uh, so I very much appreciate all all the work that you've done on that. Uh, this has been a long process with a lot of interaction back and forth with the public, and that is continuing tonight and will continue in the future um, as we continue to uh, revise this, um, like reevaluate and revise um, going forward. Um, 
and just just point of reference, something something that you don't think about um, when it, we all received that email from um, the McDonald's franchise about polystyrene, and the assumption is polystyrene is the the expanded foam, uh, like the cups that um, you used to get at Dunkin' Donuts that you no no longer get now because they're paper. Uh, there was I had no idea that polystyrene is also that's the uh, expanded form. The extruded form is the compressed form that you use as a cap on your cup. And that is also the, the, uh, what your um, utensils are made out of. So, you know, as we continue through the process and there's this dialogue and interaction uh, from, you know, all sides uh, in the matter, uh, we can figure out we need to refine this. So maybe we should, like, uh, eliminate that word extruded or, or look at fixing that definition. Uh, so that it, it enables um, those caps to, to continue to be used without without a problem for uh, a company like McDonald's where they don't have an alternative. So um, that's basically it. I think we've come a long way and I'm really excited. Councilor Baumgartner. Whether you support this ordinance or do not, uh, coming out here says a lot. I wish more people did uh, and there are, are no shortage of opportunities to let your voice be heard. Uh, so thank you for doing so, um, and I'm very excited for today. Um, we've heard a lot about kind of Connecticut and this town, um, how it, this town may not be recognizable any longer, uh, or Connecticut's such a terrible place to do business. Um, in reality, I'm very excited to be in a state uh, where we're talking about these issues, a town where we're being forward thinking about the way we uh, treat our planet, uh, we treat our local um, our, our, uh, our uh, Long Island Sound, um, our rivers, um, and our local waterways. It's so incredibly important that we prioritize these issues, ensuring that we do not pollute, and we certainly play a role in, um, in ensuring that we do not litter um, or you know, contribute more to uh, these, this trash problem that we've developed. Um, but it's also important that we hold uh, businesses accountable to be good players uh, in the system because uh, I, for one, uh, also um, go to Dunkin' Donuts uh, and enjoy their coffee. But uh, obviously, there is a cost uh, to um, uh, a cost uh, that uh, ultimately the environment has to bear. Um, so looking forward to our t conversation. I know um, we're going to be discussing some potential uh, changes to to the ordinance, but um, this has been a long time coming. Um, we should be really proud of ourselves, but more importantly, again, thank you for everyone who has been um, so intimately a part of this process, and we certainly couldn't have done it without you on both sides. Are there any other counselors who wish to speak? Councilor Franco. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out and for all the work that's been put into this and helping us. Um, I also remember when we first started this, it was supposed to be an educational thing and trying to educate the community and people in the community and businesses and hoping that they would get on board and help. And it, and it sort of evolved and there are some things that um, in the essence of what we were trying to do was reduce some plastics by having an alternative that was um, economically compatible and that's why things like um, the cutlery was removed because there is not an alternative that is, you know, economically feasible to replace that. Um, I know about the lids. I think that's something we will discuss later, but the essence of what we were talking about was not to take away those type of lids. That we were, that what we were discussing was the foam, polystyrene foam, um, like with the clamshell takeouts. That's, I think, what, that was originally discussed and we didn't even just um so that was my perspective on that and i want to be business friendly and i want to make sure that we're not putting an overburden on our businesses in town and that's very important to me and um but i think some of the things that we've come up here with are easily replaceable without too much of a a burden on a business and I think that's why, as I've, I've picked a lot of things apart in this, and I've tried to take it on the aspect of, if I was a business owner, um, how would this work out for me? So 
I think um, we're pretty close to the best we can do right now and while taking into consideration the businesses in our town. And I do believe many businesses were reached out to um, as the Economic Development Committee had also had a forum and brought in businesses and they had a big discussion and I think that also opened the door to more communication with businesses in our town that the Economic Development Committee will be going forward and doing new things with them. So thank you for everybody coming out and that's it, thanks. Councilor Parker or Melendez, did either of you wish to speak at this point? I just want to thank everyone for coming out to speak um, and know that you are always welcome at our town council meetings to come and voice your concerns and all our meetings are public meetings. So um, everything's on the record and transparent. Uh, Councilor Bumgardner, we are on to room numeral seven. Would you please move the consent calendar? Yes, so I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar, uh, which includes items uh, uh, 2019-827, December 3rd, 2019 minutes, and 2019-28, uh, 828 special trust funds uh, contributions for December, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Bumgardner and seconded by Franco. Is there any discussion on the minutes or the special trust fund contributions? Councilor Bordelon. On page five, under election of mayor, um, to my understanding, after rewatching the video again, because I love to record all meetings to rewatch them just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, my understanding is that with a total of nine councillors, uh, seven for uh, Mayor uh, Grenatowski, um, two for Bum, um, Councillor Baumgardner, I believe that one councillor abstained for both those votes. So I just wondered and wanted clarification for that. I might be wrong, but. The clerk can certainly go back in and take a look at that. Just the numbers are not right. Is there anybody up here that did not vote on the, went up for the mayor? You All right, so if that could be corrected, that okay. there was one abstention um, for Baumgartner, I believe. Is that correct, Melendez, for Baumgartner? And for both. Yes, that's what I thought as well. So thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other discussion of the minutes or the special trust fund contributions? No. Councillor Baumgartner. Uh, also on page five, on that same paragraph, um, it's Councillor Baumgartner, uh, but it's misspelled. Yeah. Yeah. I just would like to thank all the people that are making these wonderful contributions to the town. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the consent calendar um, as to be amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? So moved unanimously. We are on to um, communications and reports, and I just wanted to say that we have um, our legislative delegation here waiting to talk to us, so um, we could please keep it concise. That would be helpful for them. Councilor Baumgartner. <coughs> Do you have any communications, sir? Communications. Oh, uh, nothing to report, but happy uh, New Year and happy uh, holidays. Thank you, Councilor Parker. Um, happy New Year, and I just want to announce two things. Um, attended the Southeastern <coughs> SET TV annual party where they had local artists. So if it, you guys have a chance, please go there and check out the local artists. We have some <coughs> wonderfully talented people. And on behalf of the mayors, I attended the Safe Futures event and received information about tours, that they do give tours at their facility and you can go onto their website and they do have them on Thursdays at 4.30 if you are interested. Thank you, Councilor Franco. Uh, I attended the Beautification Committee meeting and we are having a fundraiser on February 16th. It will be at Grill 92, which is up at Fairview at 2 p.m. with speaker Jim Streeter, who's the town historian. Um, he will be giving a be giving a presentation on Groton landmarks, past and present. So it's a new, new topic for him that he's compiling f just for us, I guess. Um, the cost will be twenty dollars per person, and all proceeds will go to support Groton beautification. So if anybody would like to make it, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Heat. All right, I received uh, an invitation to Avery Point Yukon Alexei von Schlipp Gallery. Uh, there's an art opening uh, among the tides, and it's. Um, going to be open from January 23rd to March 15th with a reception on the 24th from 5 to 7 p.m. at the gallery, uh, which is located on the second floor of Brantford House and um, at the Avery Point campus. 
uh, and just wanted to note that as uh, part of her uh, project, um, the artist Elizabeth Ellenwood and UConn Marine Sciences Professor Evan Ward uh, have been conducting, um, he conducted a, a research uh, on microplastics in shellfish and um, will um, make a, and a, also global plastic pollution, will make a presentation on February 25th. It'll be a lecture at the Avery Point um, and it's titled Visualizing Plastic, Integrating Science and Art to Inspire Change. Thank you. Councilor Obrey. Rachel stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I've been working on. But uh, I guess uh, the only thing I, I thought I might mention tonight is the, as the uh, year goes forward, I think it would be nice if we, as we are reporting, saying that we are there to represent the council, uh, not necessarily that I attended. So I'm hoping we might approach it a little differently. Thank you. Councilor Bordelon. Thank you. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I did have someone reach out to me, and I was at one of the high school basketball games for the girls, and they're doing a fundraiser, uh, so I figured I'd share it. Uh, they're selling uh, long sleeve t-shirts that have Falcon family on the front, $15 at all the girls' home games. And um, I also did attend, I attended not as a counselor, but it just so happened that it was actually a beneficial uh, way of being there um, with Ledge Light Health District. Um, I was attending as an ambassador for another program I'm part of, but they did have other town officials in attendance. So I kind of listened in a dual hat role, um, and it was about uh, just this area and how to um, uh, raise health concerns and different things uh, for the community and outreach and um, different uh, data that they're collecting. It was actually very informative, but I, once again, was in attendance as an ambassador for a different program but kind of felt like I was a community leader in a different uh, form, so. Councilor Melendez. Uh, no communications, no report. Councilor Sapere. No report. Um, I just wanted to mention two things. Uh, Groton Community Meals is gonna be expanding to Wednesday nights at Westside Middle School, and they are gonna be in need of volunteers. Um, if you are, um, a, a chef, the main chef is looking for an apprentice, and they also just need regular volunteers to help out with that. And then I also want to put in a plug for an event that's happening at the Groton Public Library tomorrow evening at seven o'clock. Uh, Dr. Warren Burroughs is doing a presentation on climate change. Uh, Clerk of the Representative Town Meeting. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the Representative Town Meeting met on December 11th. It was their first meeting, so they were uh, all given the oath of office. There also was an election of District 1, uh, Representative Lisa Luck was elected to fill a vacancy. Uh, District 2, Ian Thomas was elected to fill a vacancy. And Christina Fitzgerald from District 6 was elected to fill a vacancy. And uh, the moderator was elected, uh, that's Sima Eben. And so uh, their next meeting is tomorrow, uh, that would be January 8th at 7.30 at the Groton Senior Center. Thank you. Clerk of the Council. There's so much to tell you. But <laughs> I'll, I'll send it in an email <laughs> and report next month. All right, very good. Mr. Manager. Uh, good evening and Happy New Year. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick things. Each of you should have a copy of our CAFR at your spot. There will be a presentation next week at the Committee of the Whole. So if you get a chance to look it over and think of any questions before then. Uh, other than that, I just want to mention, as we're aware, the, uh, the hot water, the uh, boiler at the Senior Center the main one had went out. Um, a smaller one was put in as a temporary measure. Uh, a replacement full-size boiler is, has been installed and everything's fully operational. Great. That's all I have. Thank you. And I don't believe we have department head, superintendent, or board of education here. So we are on to <coughs> um, number nine, committee reports. I don't have anything. I'm sorry. Last minute. Uh, Councilor Zapari. Uh, directed to Mr. Burke. Yes. Uh, at the last town council meeting, there was an issue over the uh, taco truck on uh, uh, Fort Hill Road, right. next to Johnson's Hardware. Uh, there, w there were some complaints about problems, and you commented that you were looking into it. What has developed with that problem? Uh, the latest on that is a 30-day notice of violation was issued by our zoning enforcement official to them. It's El, El uh, Emiliano food truck. Um, but in the meantime, after that was issued, they have submitted or in the, are preparing to submit a updated site plan um, 
for review. So that's the latest. I'll keep you updated, though. How about ledge light for uh, health? Uh, I've not had a report from them. I know they were sending someone over there. And part of the concern is making sure, for one thing, the trucks moved every night as per the rules. And um, my understanding is the operator has um, acknowledged that he needs to do that. So. Thank you. But oh, what's it, now the site plan, the new site plan review, I think the operator signed it and the owner needs to sign it now. Um, I believe it's initially an administrative review by, by planning staff. However, if they think it gets beyond them, it could go to the planning commission. But I will let you know once I know more Can about it. Can you keep us posted sure. on that? Yeah. Councilor Melendez? Um, just a, a question. In a previous meeting, we changed um, an ambigu ambiguity in the uh, plastic ban ordinance because it was like, it could be interpreted in a way that we didn't mean. Correct. Could we change uh, the polystyrene since it could be like an addition of just one word? I, I, I was forwarded thing? a copy of the email earlier from uh, the McDonald's franchise owner. I did talk with two of our attorneys, Eileen Duggan and uh, and Rich Cody, and they, as long as it's less restrictive you're going, as long as you're not trying to add something new in, you can make the change, because that was never the intent, and it's less restrictive, so if you want, you can make that change. Yeah. And we can discuss that more fully when we get to that item on the agenda. Okay, Okay. very good. For the manager? Yeah. Yes. I have Orland. another question. Um, it says, has there been any communication mm -hmm. with the new uh, Stonehenge select woman uh, in regards to the bridge in Mystic? Has there any talks about that well, yet? I had uh, I met with uh, her, and, well, Christmas, time's flying through Christmas, <laughs> let's say approximately four weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, on different topics, but one of them was about the bridge to remind her um, that that's been, to give her some background on that and to let her know that I think she was already aware of it, but we did discuss it. She was going to talk with her finance board about it. Um, we have a CIP in our initial list for it. My intention is to put, is to recommend funding our portion of it. Um, but I will let you know once I hear anything back. But it is on our radar. Actually, I've talked to her twice about it now. Thank you. Very good. Um, I don't think we have anything from Committee of the Whole. Is there anything from Temporary Rules? They're going to be meeting. Yes. Next week. Councillor Parker? No. We're making, Councilor Obrey? We're making arrangements to meet next week. Very good. And that, could you please shoot an email to the whole council so that we can all attend if we wish to? Or no, we don't want you to. We don't want <laughs> Well, too bad. <laughs> um, personnel and appointments? Uh, our December meeting was canceled, so our next one is January 21st. Okay, and the regular rules committee, nothing, correct? <coughs> okay, very good. So we're on to new business. And we have Senator Summers, uh, Representative Conley, and Representative Dela Cruz. If you'd like to come on up to the table, please. Uh, we have one microphone. Sorry about that, Representative Dela Cruz. You could take that one. Yes, that would be great. Check, check. Pretty soon you'll be bringing your own. Yeah, he'll bring his own speakers in. <laughs> He's probably got them in the car. <laughs> you got them out in the truck? Do it, Joe. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for um, sitting through uh, local government at its best. You've all lived this before, so you can appreciate um, how good it is to have the public representing their views to us. Um, so the, the format that I think would work best for us this evening is if um, each of our delegation, members of the delegation, would give us like three to five minutes on what they want to brief us on. Um, and then that would allow all of the counselors then time to individually ask questions or view their opinion. And what I would just stress is that um, individual counselors may ask about their priorities, but please know that uh, we will be discussing anything that would actually come out of the council as a whole um, that the council all agreed upon and had consensus, and we would forward that to you much more formally. Thank you. So, Senator Summers, would you like to begin, please? Sure. Um, I am here, uh, you know, I thought our meeting normally is to hear what your legislative priorities are so that you can tell us what you would like to see from us as the delegation representing you rather than what our individual priorities or bills are um, you know for the for the next upcoming session it is a short session so we only have 12 weeks and you cannot introduce bills individually like you can in the previous session you have to ask write a letter and ask the permission of the committee to take up your ideas so I do have bills that are in that will um, affect Groton um, in areas of tourism uh, public health um, there are some for 
uh, flexibility of mandates on municipalities. So they're all very beneficial for the town of Groton. Um, but really, I was here to hear what your <coughs> legislative priorities are. What do you want to see from our delegation? Rather than me talking to you, I'm here to listen, to have you tell us what does Groton need or what we can do um, to help the council. Thank you. Representative Conley. Thank you. My, my voice is a little off tonight, but you know, life happens, and apparently so don't colds. Um, so just like uh, Senator Summers did, it's, it's so important that we hear from you guys, especially during a short session. Uh, we do have time frames when we need to have public hearings by, and although May, um, the first Wednesday in May seems really far away, at this point in January, it, um, we all know that the spring does blink by. Um, I sit on judiciary, transportation, and planning and development. And Judiciary Committee has been very busy on our off session. Um, we have a lot of bills going on um, that really are meant to protect um, residents and citizens. Um, and some of our committees have been meeting off session in task forces. Um, and we had a few great announcements today about um, bills to help sexual assault victims coming out of judiciary to, to help us, uh, minors who are victims of sexual assault, as well as we had uh, a bill come out today, or discussions coming out today, um, about smoking and vaping to try to protect our, our children across the state of Connecticut from smoking and vaping. Our budget last year, as you know, Joe and I uh, did vote for it and provided the town with, with uh, very fair funding for town services. It also provided additional money for um, the school-based health center at Mary Morrison School. And I, our um, ribbon cutting at that Mary Morrison School is the 14th of this month at 5 p.m. So if folks uh, can attend, please do attend. It's open to the public, I believe, to to get a tour of the um, school-based health center area, as most of us are um, in the school every day and may not have had an opportunity to see it yet. Um, the budget that we did vote for also had an extra $300,000 for Groton next year um, for the Alliance funding, and we were able as a group to get um, additional Alliance funding for this year so that the Board of Ed and the town can work together to try to help our students. I think it's um, one of my pr budgeting priorities, not speaking for anyone else, but that everyone probably does agree, to make sure that we do um, keep the town appropriately funded by the state. And then that you guys let us know, um, as you're doing the CIPs, if you can give us a heads up for things that you may need bonding for, the sooner we know, the easier it is, because again, these the short session does fly by, and we don't want to um, miss a deadline or have to let things go um, additional months because it hasn't had a public hearing. We do have some requirements for public hearings by certain dates, so we want to make sure we, we get all of our, our bills and all of your needs in. So please reach out to us any time that you need. Thank you. Representative Dela Cruz. All right, Chris said most of it, and I'm not getting close to this mic now after you did Sorry. that. But, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I feel the same way. There's a lot of, we ask you guys, I think, during the course of the year, if there's something that you were looking forward to. Uh, I'm not gonna say all the stuff that I am working on, but I will say that as a, as a constituent of all of you, I am very proud of the work that you guys did on with, with the single-use plastic. I know it's not easy. Um, it, you know, there's, again, once you get elected, because I didn't care before I went up to Hartford, I didn't care one thing about plastic. It wasn't on my radar. Uh, it was, I used to joke with Andre about how I thought he was, he was trying to save every tree and every fish. Uh, but when you start getting in meetings where they, they, they put information in front of you that shows you that there'll be more plastic in the sea uh, than fish by 2050, that, that we do need to make steps, that we do need to, to make progress, and that's, that's a little bit of progress was made today. And, uh, and I thank you guys for what you did there, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just sit back and listen to things that interest you guys, and, uh, and we'll try to figure out how we can help you uh, attain the goals that, of the town. Thank you very much. Um, so again, we'll be going through and expressing our individual concerns at this point. So um, do you just want to go down the line? We can start with Councilor Baumgartner and each one of us. If we have something we'd like to say, we can discuss with them. But please keep in mind that no one councilor speaks for the whole council, and that if there is a consensus item that the whole town would like um, for you to go after on our behalf, we would express that as a formal, um, a formal ask. Thank you. Councilor Baumgartner. I think one thing, um, speaking for myself, uh, would love to see, and so many others, I think, in this town, it would be a, a statewide ban on uh, polystyrene. Um, certainly, um, you know, at the very least, starting with containers. Um, I think there is bipartisan interest, you know, uh, to an extent for that, but um, certainly, you know, the steps that the state has taken um, in, um, you know, ultimately banning single-use uh, plastic bags is a, is a great start, but there's a lot more work to do. 
Um, one thing that I've uh, been kind of obsessed with since you know I first got involved in, in politics, and I know S Senator, S Senator Summers has taken a lead on, um, is looking to uh, scale up uh, anaerobic digester facilities. That's one of my bills. Yes. Just go back in. Um, perfect, and, and would certainly love to see you know a, a facility like that established in Groton, and um, you know I think it would be um, is very much a part of the conversation we're having about um, reducing plastics from the waste stream, and um, certainly um, you know uh, compostable um, products, and, and certainly um, you know um, food scraps. Uh, that way, it doesn't go to the incinerator, and um, you know it, it can um, be turned into compost and energy, uh, which are two things the state so desperately needs. So. Um, certainly, you know, ensuring that we have the funding to, you know, protect our schools and, um, and adequately fund uh, town government. Um, but obviously, I know the, the budgetary pressures right now, but, you know, Senator Summers organizes that in both of um, you know, our two Democratic uh, reps, you know, that um, the state does have to change business and, um, in terms of the way we, we spend money in the long haul. And that's, that's just a conversation that will be had, and certainly you'll, you'll all have it. So. Um, thank you all for, for the work you do, um, and um, I wish you all the best of luck. Can I ask a question really quickly? Yes. Um, one of the things that I would like to get your input back on is, um, and I don't want to go through all my bills because there's quite a few of them, but one of the initiatives that we are looking at from a health, public health standpoint and from a recycling, uh, I guess, uh, issue that we have, um, big problem, is and, and, and the bill that I have is complicated, and I, I don't want to get into all the minutia of the details, but think about NIPS. That is the number one polluter. There's no deposit on it. Um, I've done the research, so you can buy a 10-pack of NIPS that are a dollar a NIP, and the volume is greater than a fifth of alcohol, but it's cheaper, so everyone buys the NIPS, and they are, are everywhere. Um, there's one place in Groton that I have been stalking on a weekly basis. Clearly, people go by and they must be drinking on the way to work or on the way home. It doesn't matter. It's not a judgment. But there were 600 NIPS within one week. And I think that I've talked to the Council of Governments at one of the meetings I went to, and everyone had the look like, we want to get rid of NIPS. So please give me your feedback on NIPS. I'm not trying to target NIPS, but because there is no deposit and they are you know, non-recyclable right now, plastic. They can be recycled. There are machines that will take them back, but they have no value because there's no deposit. So please give me your feedback on that. There's bipartisan support on that so, through the House and the Senate. So. And we've, we've talked about, that's come up before in our conversation, in the, how many months, years of um, debating the plastics ordinance. That has come mm -hmm. up multiple times here, so mm -hmm. I think you would have support from this council on that. Um, so. Yes. It's part of a larger discussion, but when we're, you're looking at it from a public health standpoint on um, the cost of a product for, you know, perhaps an addiction issue, possibly along with vaping, which is going to come out of public health also, um, we'd like to have your feedback. Yep. Thank you. Councilor Parker, did you have anything you wanted to speak at this point? Not at this point. Councilor Franco. I have a few things written down. Um, nip bottles were one of them. I wrote that... Um, I would like to deposit on them, and um, as somebody who has done cleanups in the town, I have also seen an enormous amount of nips. It is the highest complaint that I hear from anybody about what's being littered in our town, and I have been an advocate pushing for the nip bottle deposit, and I would really like that. Um, so that's one of them. Um, I would also like the funding for the North Stonington Bridge which is located in Old Mystic, which is shared with Stonington. Um, I spoke with the representative, the Stonington rep and the mayor at an event on Friday, and I was hoping that maybe we could somehow all work together and see mm -hmm. if this could possibly get done and if the state funding is there for that. Um, it is there. Um, another issue is, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know what I've heard, but also on Route 1 going into Mystic, there is a retaining wall that has an issue, and it being a state road, I know that um, they're working on some engineering. At, at, I'm not really sure if they're working on engineering with that, but I think it's going to take some time. But this is a big 
problem in that area. I mean, there's just these, I don't even know what they're called. The, the, the Jersey there's Jersey yeah, barriers and big orange things there. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, I've mentioned it to the DOT several mm -hmm. times. I, I think it's on their radar. They, yes. They're getting to the uh, planning stage, but. Yeah, it's taken a long time. It's been a long time. And we do get quite a few complaints in our office about it. Yeah, and we had um, a beautification input session and that a lot of people showed up complaining about that one area. Um, and also, if we could maybe have some funding for the opioid crisis that we're having in our area and to help support that. And. The other things, I just have some questions, and I don't even know if you can answer, but those are the things that I would like to ask for, though. So I don't know if I, my questions could wait. Do you want to do your or, questions while you have the floor? Um, well, I have a question about the bridge abutments, which I have spoken to um, Chris about one time. But there's a lot of complaints about the abutments and how when you're driving over them and the suspension, and is there any fix for this, or is this just something that everybody has to live with? Do you mean the expansion joints? Yeah, is that the things called? that, 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 that on the Gold Star called? Bridge? Yeah, they are being repaired in the, mm -hmm. the northbound lanes. When they get done in the, the spring, over the next few years, um, they're looking at a slightly different product. But this was a first use of, of that product, mm -hmm. and while it was meant to help with snow plowing, that there'd be less ice buildup, um, sometimes when you use a first use, it, it needs to have repairs, and that's what we're dealing with now. But we appreciate everyone who reached out so we can try to get that fixed as soon as possible. Um, and I just sort of, I don't know where it stands, but some people have asked me about, on the state level, sports betting and legalization of marijuana, and is that, are any of these things moving the sports, anywhere? The sports betting bill is um, moving this year. Let me use the mic. So the sports betting uh, bill is the Connecticut Jobs and Revenue Act. A lot of us from southeastern Connecticut have been working on it um, and meeting very regularly to get that bill moving. Um, and it is the intent that we, we do that bill this year. Hopefully we can get it through the House and the Senate as well. I can tell you um, I was in the with some of the staff from the governor's office today, and sports betting and marijuana is definitely something that they're interested in pushing um, this legislative session. I don't know what it'll end up looking like, but it's on their priority list. Um, thank you. Um, I did, does anybody know what's going on at all with teachers' pensions and how it's going to be funded, and are they going to be... Anything to do with the Governor. town funding him? Funding we, them? we deflected that this year. That's that's something that you're going to see annually. Hartford trying to push that down towards towns, uh, and I, I know Chris and I, at least in the house, I know has been fighting the Senate, but we uh, completely do not agree with them trying to push that any any kind of the retirement burden onto towns. Uh, it's just not. It's, it's actually not equitable. It's not fair. If you look at the whole system of Connecticut, there's some towns that could afford that t that hit and the, the schools would not suffer, but a town like ours and, and the other community I represent in London uh, would be devastated with, with, with starting to take on that kind of a, a impact. Um, I did want to comment on your, on your bottle bills. It's, it's funny, uh, and even the gambling, because everything sounds like it's so easy uh, when you look at, at these other states that have done it. Uh, we, we actually have an agreement with, with two tribes, and we signed a, a gambling agreement with them and they have to be part of this this whole discussion. And none of the other states had to even include them in, in the discussion because they didn't they didn't have that type of agreement. So we, we, there's a lot a lot of work to do, but we're moving that way. And as far as the NIFs, uh, th there's a guy up there that has been hounding me from day one about a bottle bill. Uh, they want to increase the deposit on a can because the actual recyclers are going to go out of business very shortly uh, because the five cents doesn't pay for the people who are actually separating. Uh, what they were nervous about with the nip bottle was the, the actual compactness of it. So what we have an issue with in Connecticut now is folks will come back from any state. You buy your, you buy, a lot of people go to New Hampshire and buy their liquor. And you buy, yeah, that happens. You know that. <laughs> oh, con console. <laughs> no, but they buy their liquor and with, with, uh, with, with ease, they go to Big Y and return their cans in a Big Y. I've talked to people. I know people who actually do that. Uh, they'd be afraid, like, you could go collect thousands and thousands of five cent little nip bottles, bring them across the border and, and return them for deposit. 
which ends up being money out of Connecticut residents' pocket. And I don't know how we, how we distinguish, because you know, all, the, all the supermarkets that I have spoke to actually take more in cans, like 60 or 70 percent more back than they sold. So if they sold 100 cans of Pepsi, they take back 160. Uh, so it's very, it's, it's just difficult. Any, any, any supermarket person you talk to wants to get rid of accepting bottles back altogether. It's a huge part of their business that they don't want. So that's, that's kind of like the, type, the, the line we walk with something like that. Where do you, you know, what's going to be the impact? And, and I'm, I'm for it. I think, I, I, I do think it's one of our biggest polluters, the, the little nips. I hear it from my neighbors. They, they, that's, what, that's the cut through where I live. Uh, but th that's one of the one of the bills that is going to be tough. I think they have a lot of support, <coughs> but when you start seeing the, what could happen when you do put the five cents on it, uh, you know you got to think twice about it. If I can just add to that, the, the bottle bill um, that I worked on last year had a lot of support to do things differently. But then you have a lot of special interests that is adamantly not wanting to change the bottle bill. So I don't think that we're going to get a, a revitalization of the bottle bill, but we desperately need it. The, the deposit has not changed. When Joe was talking about the redemption centers, um, we are losing them on a daily basis. They have not had a raise in what they get paid in 38 years. Mm -hmm. So the uncollected money, that's called the sheets, it goes into an account, has been diverted you know, for years and years. Um, but that money is supposed to go to the redemption center so they can afford to take, take the bottles back. Um, the NIP bill that I was talking about, we were, you were going to have to bring it to a redemption center because nobody can take it back at a, a liquor store or grocery store. But just to give you an example of some of the, the things that were happening, the grocery stores were willing to take back wine bottles if they could sell wine in the grocery store. But then the package stores don't want them to sell wine in the package store because the package store lobby. And then if you wanted to... Um, why do we have a deposit on Coke cans but not on Snapple or iced tea? Because the people, Coca-Cola or whoever is manufacturing it, doesn't want to put it on there. So it's so complicated, um, and, but it's something that really needs to be looked at. That's why I'm hoping if we can at least raise the conversation in a different way about um, these items, then we could maybe put pressure on to revamp our entire bottle bill because it's not working in Connecticut. And none of our stuff's getting recycled either because it is not going, we have single stream, we don't have independent streams. So all those countries you were talking about earlier, <coughs> they're polluted with our stuff that we ship there. So um, it's a complicated issue. And also I'll just leave you with this on the deposit. Um, the data shows that has been presented uh, that if you raise the deposit to 10 cents, the recycling jumps up to 90%. When it's at five cents, less than 42% of the stuff is recycled. So it's a lot to think about, um, but it's something that absolutely has to be addressed because you're going to see it in your tipping fees to get rid of your garbage. Um, so. Okay, Councillor Heath. Um, the bottle bill is actually very timely. Um, I'm not sure if uh, you're talking about uh, redemption or banning the plastic bottles outright. Sorry? Are you talking about a, a redemption fee, like five cents, 10 cents, or are you talking about banning the bottles outright? I was talking about how complicated the bottle bill is if you want to recycle the bottles or your plastic bottles or your glass bottles. Um, and when people were referring earlier to all these countries that have all this plastic, a lot of that plastic comes from us because we don't actually recycle our stuff here. We ship it overseas. That's what I was talking about. Gotcha. All right. Um, yeah, so just... What's nice is it fits right in with the plastics ordinance that we're putting in today, um, hopefully. Um, but there are only there are very limited things that we can do at the town level. So state level, you can do, of course, a lot more. Um, you could ban the plastic nip bottles, uh, preferably. Um, and then, of course, you, you come up with the issue of what does that do to state liquor stores and, and all that uh, if someone can drive across the border to Rhode Island. Uh, unfortunately, um, but I'd like to see in that vein of thought a state program to promote anti-litter, like an anti-litter campaign. Uh, I remember growing up in Texas a hundred years ago, uh, there was like some big owl that walked around. Oops, and said, the owl. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe it was national. Um, <laughs> give a hoot, don't pollute. And you know, it seems like people don't know what you're talking about. So something like that, the state could do. Uh, take it to the next level. Um, I'd like to see trash cans at state parks. Um, because people don't take their trash out of the state parks, they leave it there. 
Um, and we have uh, cleanups every year uh, over at the Avery, not Avery Point. How is Bluff, this? Bluff Point? Yes, Bluff Point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so of course that costs money. Um, but another thing that came out of uh, the discussions with our Coastal Resiliency Task Force is that there is reduced funding for um, Coastal Resiliency um, grants. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, a couple of ideas, uh, but I didn't bring them with me tonight. Um, so I can pass those along uh, by email or we can discuss them and decide if it's something the council would like to, to pursue. Uh, so aside from that, um, I did have a request from um, a constituent to put um, reflective paint on state highways, um, specifically Long Hill Road. Um, and like if there's yellow in the middle and white on the side when it's dark uh, and someone's headlights are coming towards you or it's raining, you can see the side of the road. Um, and that would be really helpful. Um, I guess the last thing is um, we've talked about it, but I don't, we've sort of just kicked around the ideas. Um, we don't have county government in Connecticut, and if we want to approach things regionally, we kind of have to reach across and, and talk to neighboring towns. Um, and it would be nice to have some sort of infrastructure where if we wanted to have like, um, I don't know, public works director, uh, clerk, uh, something uh, where we could share it among towns, um, that would be good. I'm going to go there too. So, Mr. Burke. Uh, just uh, I just got an email today from the COG that they they are looking at. I think they've been awarded grants to look at some regionalization efforts, and the, it'll require each uh, town to do a resolution of support. So you'll be seeing something on that soon. I'll send you some information. Yeah. All right. Thank you. REPT grant. I think is that what mm -hmm. it is? Yeah. Councilor Obrey. Um, I'm sure that you're all working on it, but I'm hoping that you're going to come up with some resolution in order to be able to help with the tourism financing. Yep. That's a really serious uh, situation for our area, and I believe right now we're at zero uh, for funding. And no, if you want to no, you're me, funded. What's fully, that? You're fully funded. Oh, you're we did. Okay. The regional, well, the, east, the, the eastern regional tourism districts. Okay, thank you. So well, we're fully funded in the budget, but the regional district does have to um, submit their 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 audit to access their money. Okay. <coughs> and we've asked for the tourism I, caucus to. I did have read that. I stand title. corrected. Um, the other uh, thing that uh, that I've had quite a few people talking to me about because I guess of where I live, but uh, um, the. In and this is a problem that doesn't necessarily come from the council, but I thought I'd bring it up anyways. Um, under the insurance part of, of uh, regulations, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact of the, uh, uh, the increases that have been put on long-term care mm -hmm. and the fact that the hardship that it's, that it's putting on elderly people and at a time when they can probably at least uh, handle an increase. And from what I've read, uh, we just did have one increase, but there's also been two others approved. And uh, I think it's going to make it so that you're, you're going to, the burden on the state will become higher because these people will not be able to take care of themselves. Right now, you have a, a good part of the, of the senior community trying to make it so that they're not a burden. But if they have to let this insurance go, they will be, because where do you turn? So I'm hoping that you all can really be aware of this and in the appropriate committees, try to, uh, if possible, reverse some of the damage that's been done. I know that would be very, very difficult, but I hope that it can be really uh, uh, on your radar. Uh, I don't know how those three got through so easily, and maybe it wasn't easy. I, I don't know the background of it yet. But I think it's something that really has to be looked at. And the other thing that I, you may already be working on is some kind of uh, cooperation with towns and cities to allocate some assistance to put protection in, plan, in place for government buildings, you know, our municipal building, our town hall, and et cetera. I, I, unfortunately, I think it's come to a point where it's needed. And I doubt that we are in a position to have money to do much. And I think it's something that has to be a cooperative effort between the town and the state to at least have something 
in place. Um, I, I, again, I always say I could be wrong, but I don't think there's anything in place right now. Do you have a secret button up here? There used to be a little red button up there. I don't know if there's But it is something that should be looked at, and, it, and I, th I think that's something that the, you know, the state at, at your level and our level could work together mm -hmm. to try to make it happen. Not so much for us, but for the people that are there every day. I, I want them to feel secure in the, where they're working. And uh, I guess those are um, the only other thing I was going to share. And uh, this morning I woke up to a, uh, a, t a talk on uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Strawberry Park. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. But it's a historic preservation in Portsmouth, and it's right on the water. And uh, the problems that they're having up there are the problems that we have, but for some reason it seems to be much more severe. And I think it would be good uh, to get to know Portsmouth a little bit better. It might help us in anticipating some of the things that are going to happen here. But just for an outreach program for you, you don't have enough to do. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, we're down to four councillors. Councillor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to thank you all, all three of you both for coming. It's really great that you guys are able to come out and um, be a part of the meeting tonight. And uh, um, But one clarification uh, concern that I have, um, maybe directed to the town manager or uh, to the mayor. Um, under, the, under our agenda here, it says legislative update. <clears throat> and then under here, it also states Senator Summers and State Representative Joe Della Cruz and Chris Connolly will provide the council le legislative updates. Um, and as several of them both have, or all of them have mentioned, that they were actually coming for us to have more of a plan with questions to ask them and, and, and be ready to give them something to take back. I just think in future, it'd be, maybe if we can make sure this is updated to the right language uh, for transparency purposes, for constituents and people in the town, just to allow for other people to maybe email and say, here's some of the concerns I'd like you to bring forward to the representatives when they come, because according to this agenda, it doesn't read as if that option was gonna be happening tonight. So that's just one thing. Moving forward, um, I think that we should look at mandatory <coughs> testing um, for all public buildings for water. Um, looking at the concern that we had at Fitch High School and the cost of that, I think nobody in this country should be drinking water not only with lead, but any other type of concerns. And I think pushing a bill or working on something where we are looking at making sure that low-income housing, senior housing, looking at schools, public buildings, are all have potable drink drinking water and landlords are required to test that water when renting or selling a home and it should be at a, at a, a level that is uh, acceptable. Um, with that, I know that Groton Public Schools follows the allowable levels they've been working with the health department. I, d I don't believe in a school setting that an allowable level should be any level of lead coming out. I think that number should be built zero, especially when you look at children and their development with brain development and, and the uh, deficiencies that can come from that. So what I'd like to see after looking around the country of all the fallout with the water as we talk about our plastic ordinance tonight, really our drinking water, making sure we're safe here and what does that look like? How would that come to be? I'm not sure, but that's definitely something on my radar. Um, and I think that's something as a state that we could own and do and require and uh, put some onus on some of our landlords and building and towns to do such, especially in public schools. Um, another concern of mine, once again, how this would look, um, a lot of people have addressed or come up to me regarding Fitch High School. Um, looking at the southeastern corner and you look at Ledger and you look at all the other schools, I think Ledger had a meeting yesterday about um, their field updating it. Fitch's field has not been updated in I don't know how long. Um, am I saying turf? Not, possibly there's flex field, there's environmentally friendly, friendly options of new structures that can come in. We have to do something. Um, our, our you know, curriculum may be rigorous and moving, but when you, when you pull into Fitch High School, there's not much to offer as far as our fields go. We are behind the curve in this corner. So I'm not sure if there's any help um, from the state as far as bonding or governing, you know, any of that. Um, I don't even know if the Board of Ed wants anything like that, um, but it's something that I would be willing to, um, I'd love to talk and see what they're interested in. Um, when you go to East Lyme, Waterford, you walk in, 
it's a, a modern stadium with uh, great uh, uh, facilities for the bathroom and restrooms like that. Um, handicap accessibility we're lacking over at Fitch High School. Um, I know, you know, at East Lyme you could have, you have uh, Killingly even has it, where the wheelchairs can be pushed right up to the edge of the stadium so people can partake and be a part of the crowd. Um, the bathrooms are in accordance for that, and we're just a little bit behind the curve at our local school. And as selection grows, we want to retain those students in our district, and I think this is something that would bring that kind of, uh, that link that we're missing here. Also, it's nice to have a stadium in our town that we can use for other state and town um, functions that's uh, up to date. We're lacking things as we've expanded. They didn't have things like um, uh, the, the lacrosse team has grown, you know, field hockey, there's so much more field use. We need those flex mixed use type of fields. Um, I know it was brought up looking at the West Mystic Stonington Bridge. I think that's been out for nine years. It's time to make action, <coughs> hoping maybe some state, like you stated, there possibly could be some funding or funding is there for that. Um, one of the other things that um, in my passing and travels, Mystic uh, and, and the Stonington side, maybe it could be a collaboration uh, type of thing, but the trash receptacles down there are outdated, somewhat non-existent. Um, I'd like to see more of a, I guess I can think of Westerly, they have the dual compartment, you know, with the handle, if a handicap or any multiple disability can use it, and it's clearly defined, and uh, maybe there's some type of bonding or something that could be done. Um, through our walking areas. Maybe it's a collaboration. We can also work with the city um, downtown through the EB corridor where there is a lot of trash that you see blown up against the, the fences and such. Um, you know, having that through our walking districts, maybe out in front of the Navy base, um, definitely downtown Mystic and a collaboration maybe with Stonington. Um, what we currently have out there is just not well marked and I don't know. Um, state roads, constant complaints about state roads, um, even Route 1 going up past the restaurants there, it's uneven, it's, it's, it needs um, reflection as well, but it would be nice to have some of that stuff that's been, I think Route 1 going up Hamburger Hill, as I call it, has had that uneven little, you get a little dance ride on the way down for probably over uh, many, many years. So looking at some of our state roads. Um, and the last thing is, I, I also have on here, is the coastal um, resilience and looking at how we can support our towns from an environmental standpoint as we move forward with the seas rising, winds and rains, making sure those support systems are here, um, and maybe even funding having such a resource of a person that can be hired from an environmental standpoint to cover a region or a town. Um, support from the state would be helpful. Um, my, my last uh, thing that I'm looking at is uh, pre-existing medical conditions. There's been a move for a lot of that, and it affects all of us in Connecticut, I, and so that has been out of the, out of the, that has been addressed. But from the standpoint of life insurance and other insurances, once you have an existing medical condition, still your people are being treated unfairly and are being judged based on that. Um, some states you can call and they say five years you can reapply or add your numbers. And Connecticut seems to be at 10. So I'm curious as to why we're still so high um, and looking at that from a standpoint of we don't want to keep penalizing a person who's already been through something and give them the right to pay their fair amount for their deductibles, but allow them the right to um, have that access to the care that they deserve and the coverage that they need for their family. Um, so just those are the things that I have. But um, once again, in future, it would be nice to have the wording um, say such so that maybe people under public comment might would have came tonight to uh, address some questions that they might have wanted pushed forward. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would address uh, moving, moving backwards a little bit. You, you, start, you ended with the insurance issue, and I think that's something that we try to, to go after every year. We happen to be in the state that is the insurance capital of the world, and when you look at another state that's negotiating with an insurance company on what a certain rate would be, if they're Minnesota, they don't have the same type of dealings that we have. And being on the insurance committee, we deal a lot with the, the folks that actually are the heads of those companies, and there's a lot of talk about taking the ball and going home. and in Hartford being empty, if we make any attempt to make anything look remotely good for health care. Uh, last year, Kevin Lumbo had a bill that was, it wasn't a Medicare for all. He was just going to take the power of, of together, uh, basically taking 44,000 employees and offering that insurance program to McDonald's or to Hillary Company, where I work with 12 people, or to, to, to Jim's Landscaping, where they could buy in and the insurance companies all but said that they will leave and Hartford will be an empty town. Uh, so that's kind of a, 
you know, where, we're st where we stand, a lot of negotiations that way. As far as uh, the lead water in schools and pipes, I think Ron's done an unbelievable job of addressing it. I was proud to be on a building committee with people that I'm here with now, represent. We were, we were on the council before voting for schools mm -hmm. and to see where they came and be able to be in Hartford and get that money for those schools as a, mm -hmm. as a team, as a legislative team, to me was huge because you eliminate a lot of those problems when you do build new. And that's why I was ex so excited mm -hmm. that you guys voted that way, to, to build those schools new, not to, not to dig up old pipes out of the ground and try to make them work. And I think we're gonna see, you know, Good progress because we're going to have almost all brand new schools except for one uh, when we're all done with this with this whole 2020 plan. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that a lot of the things you mentioned cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned Route One and being uneven, uh, now up there we have to weigh uh, what's important. And right now, what's important is a half of a billion dollars that's going to go into the Gold Star Bridge. Seven billion dollars that has to go into the Waterbury Mixmaster. We have a $69 billion deficit, infrastructure deficit, and it's a monster. And we will see less, not more. The TRB that I talked about earlier, teacher's retirement, uh, that most people sitting at home probably don't really realize what that is, that is a monster. It is a monster that could eventually hit the shores of Groton, uh, and that's why I think we really need to be forward thinking in how we spend our money, whether it's on infrastructure, how we raise our money, because we are about to hit a tsunami of, of, of debt. And I don't, I don't always, when I talk about debt, I don't, I don't think of the debt in monetary terms. Even like in the environment, we can, we can leave our kids with a $40 trillion debt when, when I die, it's probably gonna be 40 trillion, but we can't reverse what we do to the oceans. We can't reverse underfunding education when they're young. Uh, so that's why we have to start, you know, again, when you're, th when you're thinking of all those ideas, they're great ideas, but I can tell you the pennies are, are coming harder and harder to find up there. And uh, that's, but we're gonna address that. Not, probably not all in a short session, but hopefully we do. Yeah. Okay, like, we have I, three more counselors to I, go. I was just like, thank you for your comments. I appreciate them. I was just drafting up some ideas yeah. as I sat here because I was trying to prepare to, um, and I appreciate all the work that you've done for the Groton schools. I was just looking at a broader thing of making Action. it a, a priority to make sure no lead is in any building. In our, Senator Summers, did you want yes, to add? Yes, just quickly. The Public Health Committee did a lead initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to share you the, right. with you the bill after, and I'm happy to share with you why it can't pass at zero. Okay. It has to be the acceptable levels. I mean, the cost is immeasurable to try to get anybody who has a old building to measure at zero, and Public Health and the Commissioner have gone through the data and showed the acceptable level is acceptable. That's why it's an acceptable level, and we can talk about that offline. Okay, but I just want you to know it has been looked at, it has been studied for four years, and I'm happy to share with you the data you. just on that one. Thank you. Um, just quickly on insurance, when you talked about the um, pre-existing conditions, one bill that you can decide if you would like to get behind or not is another bill. It has to do with when you enter into your insurance agreement, there are drugs that are on formulary, and insurance companies notoriously in the middle of your contract want to take your drugs off of formulary. And it is up to the doctor to argue with the insurance company um, why this drug has been chosen and why the one they're substituting is not okay. And many, many, many people have pre-existing conditions, et cetera. It is something that we have been trying to get a hold of in public health. It has made it out of committee unanimously, and it is killed every single time by the lobbyists. So those are these are all issues that we've tried to address. I think many of what you're bringing up, but there are forces larger than us three here that have special interests. Unfortunately, like Joe was saying, the insurance company. Um, and trying to provide alternatives. So what we can do is just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and raising an awareness. So I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. For That's you. it. Councilman Melendez. Um, to your question, I would be supportive of a uh, NIP bottle uh, deposit. Um, but on a personal note, um, I would like to just speak on an issue that I became aware of this fall when I met way too many people who told me that they couldn't vote because they had a previous felony. Um, and I've been fortunate to live a life where I was unaware of this problem, but it affects a lot of people in Groton, it affects a lot of people in Connecticut and all across the country. And I just think that, you know, we live in a country where we value freedom, and I can't think of anything more essential to a person's freedom than their right to vote. So there's two states in New England that don't have any 
felony disenfranchising uh, laws, and I think that Connecticut should move uh, in that direction. Mm. Councilor Zapari. As I've heard everybody speak, uh, I was thinking of a, uh, uh, a song from South Pacific, uh, Happy Talk. <laughs> and uh, the way that it was in the film, there was the, the talk about the things you like to do. I think I have some happy talk about I've made to Joe and to Chris in the past about some things that should go through the judiciary, but that's not going to happen this year, so I'm not going to give any happy talk about that. I would like, and I'm surprised I'm the first one to, to speak of it here, I would like to be assured that we're going to be continue to have support for our education in the town of Groton. The state has, in the past, taken actually has covered more than half of that bill. And I'd like to think that that can continue because if it doesn't continue, the taxpayers in Groton are going to have a huge increase in their taxes. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to look at the other horn that Joe Delacroix spoke about, although the two horns of a dile dilemma. One, we want to preserve the money the state gives the town of Groton. On the other hand, I'd like to see the state curtail its spending. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it's a hard thing for you folks. You're, you're working on that all the time. But I, I was watching ABC to, tonight before I came in, and I saw the people in, in, uh, in West Hartford now have to pay an extra dime per hour of parking, and that goes to the state of Connecticut. The, Connecticut has decided to put a sales tax on the parking fees. Um, Somehow or other, we got to get a grip. We're the, one of the highest taxed states in the, in the country, and we've got to get a grip on the spending. I don't know how to do it. Uh, I've tried to represent that force on this council, uh, and at the same time, you have to do the important things, and you have to fund the important things. And I think we have three people in front of us now who are capable of doing that. And, uh, and I hope you continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple things that I would like to express personally as things that I am interested in. Um, I'm going to go, Councillor Heaton and I had discussed county government. Uh, we're both from areas where there was county government. And no offense, no, 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 Madam no, no, Clerk, no, no, no. I, would, I would love to see um, kind of what you've done with the probate courts where there is a joining of several towns together and you have one probate judge for all of those towns. I think we could very easily do that with a clerk, with an assessor, with a recorder. Um, the, the things that are really apolitical. Uh, there, there's no politics involved in recording deeds and issuing marriage licenses and assessing a piece of property. And that might be a way, um, if, you, if you use the model of the probate judge system, um, that is something that could potentially work. I know it's a long way off. Second thing is something that I met with um, Representative Dela Cruz and um, former Representative Stratton, and we talked about uh, microgrids, and we were talking about the bridge talk, but we haven't talked about the Groton <coughs> Point Bridge. So um, if there is any way you could carve out some money for climate change issues, whether it be um, addressing the problems that we're going to have with replacing these bridges to address sea level rise, whether it's you know trying to harden our infrastructure by you know funding some microgrids again, uh, we are in a perfect location to put a microgrid up here at the top of the hill with our public safety buildings, with our schools here, um, and I would I would love to see that if there's money available for that. Another issue we're going to be dealing with on the 28th, and I don't know if something could be done at the statewide level, is the short-term rental issue. Um, it's, it's very hard for municipalities to deal with this because there are very deep pockets with the entities. And um, if something could be done statewide, that would be helpful to us. Um, I have a question regarding the Municipal Stabilization Grant. Is that a categorical grant or a competitive grant? It makes a difference to us. I would let your attorney answer that question. Okay, very good. Um, punt that nicely. Punt that nicely, very but, good. Um, we are planning and development has been looking at the um, at the online rentals. Okay. Um, and we, we are struggling with the same issues that the different municipalities are about right. 
landowners' abilities to do what they want with their private property um, and the needs of others around it. So while we, we understand the struggle on that committee and we're, we're with you and hopefully we can figure something out. Thank you very much. And I will go back again to Councillor Parker because she hasn't spoken yet and then I understand Councillor Franco has another question. Two things. Um, one, as a person who carries an EpiPen, can we figure out ways of the, nobody getting in trouble for using an EpiPen? That's something else we looked at in public health. And I get where it's going, but I, no offense, Narcan can be used. I have a life-threatening, as many people probably do, life-threatening allergy. And if I'm out and can't use my EpiPen, I have to wait until a first, uh, EMT comes around to use my EpiPen. That's a big concern for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Very as, do, as do I, Julia, and um, there's another center who has a, a similar condition, and there's surprisingly a lot of people who have life-threatening allergies, and we are working on it. We did um, help the safety on the buses last year so that um, bus drivers are getting training and students can carry their EpiPens in the buses, but we do have a lot more ways to go to make it, make sure that people, if they are exposed to something, they didn't know that they don't pass away from it. Okay. In, in looking uh, at the can news. Can I ask you, you're asking if you can carry it or somebody else can carry it? Somebody else can use it because oh, I, it. I, okay. yeah, I believe I, I can use it myself. Right. That's but if I'm passed too. out, mm -hmm. I, I can't have. Right. There's a good Samaritan law that would actually cover them if they, if they knew. I had don't it. believe it does. It does. It does? It I don't think it does. I, I we went through that, that and there was even an issue trying to have bus drivers be able to give it to kids and there was a lot of pushback. The bus drivers don't want to be responsible for that either. Um, so there, you know, that's an unintended consequence. But even just to use Narcan, there was a push to have Narcan on college campuses where it would be available, where you could just take it if somebody was having something. There's the idea of the expiration date, who's responsible for that, how do they fund it. But it's certainly something that we could look at. But Epi does come up because it's so expensive. We're also looking at um, mandating certain things on the cost of an EpiPen. So okay. uh, all those things are coming up um, or have been talked about in okay. public health. Everybody's favorite topic, and I'm going to go there, <coughs> tolls. <laughs> Where do we stand? How is it going to affect Groton? Actually, how is it going to affect the state? Because it's not just going to affect us and then uh, over the state lines, too. Right now, we don't have a toll bill. I, so I can't answer what a fictitious or what a bill that someone may be drafting or may not be drafting would say, other than if a bill's issued and people like it or don't like it, please reach out. And if everyone has their opinion, if we're asked to vote, we can vote the matter you know, correctly. Well, to me, this goes back to any other issue I found out. I was not a toll guy until I got elected and went up there and saw the infrastructure deficit that I spoke about earlier. And then to know that we're surrounded by states that all have tolls. Uh, I was doing a little bit of research. If you, if you count Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, there's about 50 million people in that area and 3.5 million of them are us. Uh, same with cars. We own about 6% of the cars in all of these states. Uh, so if you just did the math and with, with the Panama Canal that's been opened up recently, they have where cars used to all get shipped into California from, from Japan, they are currently being unloaded in, in New Jersey, New York, 500,000 automobiles. So just think of this, every single solitary car sold in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, probably came on 95 and got delivered to a dealership. So when people tell me that, that our costs are gonna go up, our costs are already up. We're paying for those folks' cars to come across our roads, be delivered to a dealership, they get a destination fee. I'm sure they're charging for the miles they went through Connecticut for part of that destination fee, but we never collected on it. It's, it's one of these, and it, it, it's, it's the issue to me that, that, is, gonna, that is tough because a lot of, a lot of folks you know, are worried, of, you know, man, I can't, I, I don't know if I can get reelected or I don't know if I can do this or do that. It's a tough issue. There's a lot of people on both sides that are passionate. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people who are pro tolls that have come to see the light just like I did by, by, by uh, going to meetings and seeing what the deficit was. But I, I really, again, if we don't get tolls passed, I say it facetiously all the time, but we absolutely, as a, as, a gen, as a general assembly in Connecticut, 
should get an award for saving Massachusetts and Rhode Island and New York people <laughs> more money than their own legislators possibly could ever do. I mean, I go to New York all the time. When I was in New York on Friday, that's why my knee is so sore. I worked 10 hours in Manhattan on my knee, and I got the pleasure of paying $7.75 for a toll on the way out of New York. That eventually goes down to Washington, D.C. and gets multiplied by eight, because those roads are 80% funded by the federal government. So they go down there and grab more money that we sent down to D.C. It's, so it's, to me, it's, it's, as easy, uh, it's a very easy fix. Uh, we got rid of tolls you know, that because, of, because of the big accident. accident. Um, that's not what they would look like now. Uh, and I know, I know the other, the pinch point is if you throw them up for just trucks now that possibly could be cars. I was su supportive of them being on cars and trucks. Uh, but I, I do believe if they go on as trucks, that's, that's where people are going to say, oh, well, I just don't trust you. I don't trust the government. I don't trust this. Either way, if we don't put tolls on the road, every single budget and every dream that you guys had up there of possibly fixing the unevenness or maybe having your kids drink water without letting it, a lot of that goes away because it is all about money. In the end, you have to pay for things. In the, in the highway, there's no other, other, nothing else we do in, in our state where we can incorporate out-of-state people to help. There's no other tax we can put on. We can't do the sales tax because most of the people are buying from here. We can, there's a lot of things we can't do. That one we can do. So, I, 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 did you get my answer? I, I'm for tolls. <laughs> I got your answer. And I, <laughs> I know and we've I had the, we've had the argument myself. before. I we've know. gotten an argument before about that I because I don't think it's good. And that's why it's so important that everyone reaches out. It is. It, it's There's just a. I feel as a person who <coughs> travels a lot over the bridge, depending on where it is or cross state lines. Yes. I can plan for that. You got the easy pass. There are, and I have an easy pass, but I just found out out of all the states, three of them don't have tolls for easy pass. But my fear is someone's gonna go over the bridge. We're already being taxed on our vehicle. We're being taxed on our property. We're being taxed when we buy our car and then still paying a tax so we can drive the car on the roads that the roads aren't fixed for. So we've got to make sure that if we're using the toll money, it's got to be put where it's supposed to be put at. And I get that you guys have a lockbox for it, but it could be a lockbox for it. But do lockboxes really work? But the, t the tolls actually are completely, you would lose all your federal funding if they found that you're taking toll money and spending it on schools or diverting that money. That's the money that goes in the toll or gets collected by Easy Pass and then transferred to the general fund has to be, has to be used towards transportation, has to actually technically be used towards the road that it's on. The other thing I would remind you of as a council and as a member who, who is a, a taxpayer for Pequannock Bridge specifically with almost a $6 million budget, Every single time there's an accident on 95, my, my house turns into a parking lot, but the second thing that happens is the fire department gets called and they were on that highway almost 69 times last year. 69 times. And if they pull up on the accident, and a lot of times it's in the same place because we know there's a problem, we know how to fix it, but we don't have the money to fix it. So that fire truck pulls up there and if the chief decides that the truck needs to be lifted up or it's gonna take more than four hours, our chief, of Groton, of Quantic Bridge, calls in a full crew to sit at the fire department because they're going to be missing for four hours and they have to back them up. That's all money that comes out of Groton taxpayers. So a lot of my discussion with people that don't live on, I'm a 95er, that's what I call myself in, in Hartford. If, if, they, if they think that, again, they say, well, I don't want my Amazon package to go up. I live in Columbia, Connecticut. Well, you know what I don't want? I don't want my, my calls as traffic gets heavier to go from 69 calls from our fire department here to 169 calls, and it's my fire budget that goes up to support their Amazon package. If, if, if the, the, the veins of, of the state, the veins are carrying the blood on our highways, then the guy that's somewhere off in the middle, he's gotta pay too. And, and that's, that's my point. I mean, we've had that discussion before, and I know it's tough because nobody wants to pay more. All, there's also discounts they're talking about that if you go through a toll, you could only go through four tolls in one day in Connecticut and your car would not be binged again. 
that's one of the options they're talking about. That would that would kind of help somebody that was a traveling salesperson or somebody that was. Wait a minute. Uh, you mean across the state, four times across the state, or hit? No, the four times. If you hit the the one over in Groton and one in Old Saybrook and one here and one there, on the way back they wouldn't hit. That this is just proposal. So like Chris said earlier, we don't have an exact bill to vote on anyway. Right. So we're talking about theoretical right now, but that's been brought up as, as one of the cost savings possibly for a resident. Okay. Okay, oh. I'd just like to say two things if I can. Um, first of all, I don't think we should get in a toll discussion because we don't have a bill to mm -hmm. look at. And this is the ever, it's like waiting for Godot that never comes. It's like Rev Z now of a toll bill. Um, I do not agree with tolling because I have not seen it make financial sense and not put the burden on those who are the most vulnerable. Um, especially in my district, I have heard overwhelmingly, which runs beyond Groton, those who have, can at least afford it that have to drive the furthest to get to work will pay the most. And um, there are other alternatives to tolls that we're not going to get into now. Um, also, people do not believe, which they shouldn't, that the legislature has the discipline that the revenue for tolls will go for what it's used for because we've generated billions that's been diverted. So we're running into all those different things. Um, I do believe that eventually we'll come to some kind of uh, decision, but if we wanted to vote on tolls, we've had a year, let's get the plan and let's vote on it as far as I'm concerned, but the plan is ever evolving. So we wanna hear from you what you want uh, as far as tolls come when you see the bill, whenever that is. Okay, very good. So it is 835, and um, I just want to restate again, we thank you very much for coming out. And um, as you've done in the past for us, when we had a need, we reached out as a council of consensus, and you three have um, come through for us on, on many different occasions. So uh, we will, don't worry, we'll be in touch if we need something. <laughs> thank you so much for your time, and do good work for Groton. And with that, we're going to take a five-minute recess. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, uh, we are back from recess at 849. Uh, we have quite a few things. Most of them are routine, but we have a presentation from Mr. Barry regarding, it's, this is item 2019-830, and there is no action taken, but we're gonna listen. Yes, attentively. please, thank you. So Could you just I, introduce I, yourself? Oh, absolutely, thank yes. You. Uh, my name's Mark Barry, I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation. On my right is Mary Jo Riley. She's the supervisor for the Senior Center. And to my left is Taylor Foss from Great Blue. He will be doing a presentation, um, or showing the results of the presentation. I told him he has three and a half minutes to there do the go. whole thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> so just as a reminder, uh, last year, as part of the current budget, the council approved uh, the expenditure to uh, for the Senior Center to do a study on barriers to participation and perceptions, uh, specifically for the Senior Center. Our goal was to identify what steps uh, the Senior Center could take in order to increase participation. Uh, we went out to bid, Great Blue was awarded the contract, and we've been working with them over the last several months to put together uh, both a phone survey, uh, an online survey, and a focus group and Taylor is here this evening to present those findings to you. At the end of the presentation, uh, any questions that the council has, uh, hopefully Taylor can answer. So Thank you. at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Taylor. And we all have, you left us all a copy of the Yes, yes. Very good. We will need one for the minutes, please. We don't need it right now. Go ahead and do your thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. My name is Taylor Foss. I work with uh, Great Blue Research out of Glastonbury, Connecticut. Today we're here to discuss on the docket the uh, Town of Groton Senior Center Report of Findings, as Mark had mentioned. So just a quick overview. We're going to start with a quick about Great Blue, the company, its history, very concise there, and then an, an overview of the project. As Mark had mentioned, it, it was a mixed methodology of a phone survey, an online survey, along with a focus group session. Then we'll get into some key study findings. Mostly we'll focus on patron and non-patron analysis, a sort of a difference between the users and non-users of, of the Groton Senior Center. Then we'll dive into some key findings in terms of the drivers and barriers of the non-users specifically. 
And finally, we'll, um, we'll finish off with some considerations, which sort of take an all-encompassing view of, of the three studies and give our recommendations moving forward in terms of turning some of those non-users into users and increasing participation moving forward. So as mentioned before, Great Blue is a market research firm located in Glastonbury, Connecticut. We have been working in the industry for over 30 years with in-depth interviews, telephone surveys, digital surveys, focus groups, concept testing, journey mapping, and more. Next, we get into the project overview phase. We were commissioned, as Mark mentioned, by the Town of Groton Senior Center, here and after the Groton Senior Center, or GSC, to conduct a market research study to understand satisfaction levels of patrons as well as non-patrons. Today we'll specifically dive into the results pertaining to the non-users. The primary goals for this research study were to assess the overall sentiment and perception of Groton Senior Center, of the Groton Senior Center, excuse me, among residents and identify areas and needs of improvement in an effort to provide the best possible services to participants as well as increased participation for non-users. In order to service these goals, we had employed the three methodologies, a quantitative, a quantitative survey that was distributed through phone and um, digital, as well as a focus group session, which lasted about 75 minutes. Some of the key areas of investigation we're diving into today, overall sentiment, sentiment and perception of the senior center, gauging awareness of various programs and services, Engaging interest in various programs and services, current and preferred communication methods, most importantly drivers and barriers to participation. We'll dive into some naming sentiment and pre preference as well as how that may have some effect on um, non-users and a demographic profile of respondents. The quantitative research methodology, it was telephone and digital as well. We received 300 responses on telephone and 48 digital. The survey was a maximum of 52 questions depending on certain logic and things like that. Um, a, a respondent could potentially have less, less questions. No incentive was received. The sample was procured by Gray Blue through a third party. The target was those age 55 plus residents of Groton and some surrounding towns including Mystic, Ledger, Stonington, and Gales Ferry. The margin of error was 5.2% with a 95% confidence level and the research dates were between October 11th and November 1st. As you can see, we had a solid distribution for, for the um, age demographic with the highest frequency for those 75 or older. We also had a good distribution for um, education responses with the highest in those who have graduated college coming in at 31%. The responses were about two-thirds female and one-third male. Most, as you could probably imagine, were retired, and the income was um, distributed pretty well as well. Further, 67.5% of, res of respondents were residents of Groton, and there was a, a decent distribution with 11.5 in Mystic, 9.8 in Ledger, 7.2 in Stonington, and 4% in Gales Ferry. Um, as for residents and non-residents, we had coded those within Mystic West, which we had actually asked in the survey if they were from the west side of the Mystic River as Groton residents for purposes of data analysis. That was 76.7% of respondents and 23.3% were all other respondents. As for the qualitative or focus group portion, it had eight participants. The target were non-users within Groton and the same surrounding towns as the, the quantitative study. Participants received a $100, $100 excuse me, incentive for their time. We recruited through Great Blue. The uh, length of interview was 75 minutes and it was moderated by a Great Blue employee. The research was done on December 9th. So now we'll move into some of the key study findings. And we'll start off with usage of the Groton Senior Center as a whole, where we had <clears throat> the majority of respondents indicating that they had used the Groton Senior Center. Notably, 61% of those who had used were residents and 42% were non-residents. Those who had not used, their top reasons for not using were, one, they were too busy, two, not interested or no need, and three, medical issues. 
those who did use, the top reasons for using were exercise and dance, the cafe, <coughs> breakfast and lunch, eating, things like that, and the fitness center. Overall, those who had indicated they used the Groton Senior Center were vastly satisfied with their, with their experience at the GSC. 88.3 were very satisfied, 11.2 were somewhat satisfied. So as you can see, almost 100% of respondents who indicated that they had used the Groton Senior Center were satisfied with the experience. That was 197 total respondents. Now moving on to a patron and non-patron analysis where we looked into some of the fundamental differences between users and non-users of the Groton Senior Center. To begin, the use of similar services was low. About one-fifth of both non-users and users indicated that they used a similar facility, company, or service within the past year. Uh, things like the YMCA or other, other senior centers, community centers, and things like that were all considered similar facilities, companies, or services. The top, <coughs> excuse me, top results for people who had used similar services included the fitness center or gym, a different senior center, or a community center. There was a large aware, uh, variance in awareness of programs and services between users and non-users. As you can imagine, those who did not know about Groton Senior Center programs and services, that was the largest variance with non-patrons and patrons, followed by exercise and dance programs, the fitness center, and the cafe. So as you can see, people who were not users of the Groton Senior Center did have a notable lack of awareness of the programs and services at the center. Although this is true, after hearing a brief description of the GSC, non-users were about 70% aware of, of the, the facility. 31.1% were very aware and 38.5% somewhat aware. There was also a notable variance in top of mind recall. The question was read, when you hear the name Groton Senior Center, what two or three words come to mind? The largest variances were recorded for fun, good time, and enjoyable offerings of a variety of programs and activities and services, and a senior center place for seniors. As you can see, non-users did have a positive perception of the GSC with 80.4% of non-users having that positive perception. Although this is true, users did have a significantly higher perception, about 17%. So this finding really shows <coughs> Once, once these users get in the door and they participate and they develop a knowledgeable perception of the Groton Senior Center, their perception becomes more positive. Top um, indicated open-ended responses for non-patrons in terms of their perception of the Senior Center were hear good things, family and friends enjoy it, good programs and services, good classes, and overall great place, enjoyable. So there is a positive perception among non-users, but not necessarily as high as those who do use the facility. Further, we dove into preferred and current communication methods between the two segments. Um, when asked which of the following communication methods users and non-users currently use to get information about local community centers, programs, or events, patrons indicated newsletters as their top response. Excuse me, and non-patrons indicated newspaper. In terms of preferred methods, Non-users indicated newsletters, whereas users indicated the same at 51.8%. Now diving into a drivers and barriers analysis of specifically non-users. First, we see that the most impactful <clears throat> responses for a non-user's decision to visit the Gr Groton Senior Center, which was top two box, we call it, um, those who are total, very, or somewhat likely, was recorded for the programs and services offered, as well as the awareness of offerings. So you have 69.5% likely to impact for programs and services, and 68.3 for awareness of offerings. The next highest was time of day, but as you can see, there was a large, a large increase when you get into that programs and services slash offerings sort of category. 
Further, the highest interest in various programs and services not necessarily connected to the Groton Senior Center, but in general, were um, recorded for trips, day and extended, music, arts, and enrichment, and fitness center. The top was uh, indicated for trips at 46.4%. When respondents were asked, um, excuse me, when respondents were asked um, how likely they are to participate from a scale of one to five, from not at all likely to very likely, the top indicated response was again trips, day or extended, followed by cafe, breakfast or lunch, and music arts and enrichment. So as you can see, we have um, interest and likelihood of participation, both coming in at trips, day and extended, so there is, there is some potential there. In the focus group analysis, we saw a significant amount of contextual information that showed <coughs> focus group participants believed discounted rates, guided tours, and open, houses of, open house events would potentially help increase participation overall. Again, it comes back to that overarching theme of high satisfaction within users, getting these non-users into the door, altering their perception, as those who do use have a high perception, have a p high positive perception of the center. So they had indicated ideas like discounted trial rates, guided tours, open house events, and essentially just breaking through that key barrier of initial participation. Another barrier cited by focus group participants was communication, specifically a lack of online communication, social media awareness, and things like that. Um, one participant had mentioned a, uh, a phone app and just digital methods of communication and marketing that could help increase that, that awareness. Further, we dove into sentiment regarding a name change, where non-patrons indicated their, their top potential name was the Senior Community Center, followed by none of the above, the Wellness and Activity Center, an adult, active adult center. When asked why they preferred the name they chose most, about a quarter said, tells you what it is, is descriptive, followed by suitable for all ages, does not imply senior, helps you stay active, and sounds good, up to date, and positive. Additionally, some of the focus group participants, seven out of eight of them, in fact, indicated that the word senior may have an impact on patronage, especially those who aren't, aren't necessarily considering themselves seniors. For instance, people who are under that senior range, wherever that may be these days, but that was definitely a key finding. Um, now we're diving into some of the considerations that we have when we think about the overarching story, what the data speaks, and what some of that contextual information spoke in the focus group. Our first recommendation would be to implement and evaluate trial rates and open house events. As mentioned before, the vast majority of respondents, almost 100% who have been to the GSC, reported they were satisfied with their overall experience. Those who have not used the Senior Center reported a positive perception 17 percentage points less frequently than users. Our recommendation here essentially is, is to use marketing communication methods to get these non-users into the door and potentially convert them into users. Secondly, our, our recommendation would be to increase and adapt marketing communication efforts. We had some mention of social media marketing, um, apps, applications, phone applications, things like that. We also recommend taking full advantage of the Discover 55 newsletter as it's an advantageous medium to promote new and current programs and services. And lastly, although we cannot confirm or deny that changing a name change would be the correct move moving forward, we don't have enough information financially, branding, and things like that, but based on the data, we did find some insight that changing a name could, in fact, increase per perception by um, rebranding re the Groton Senior Center as not only a place for seniors. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Any um, questions? Yeah, so I was going to ask her, I wanted to see if Mr. Yeah, Berry had anything he wanted to add or Ms. Riley had anything she would like to add. The focus group, uh, reading through the 30 some odd pages of uh, text was really enlightening. Uh, some of the perceptions that, that folks have, that, particularly the non-users, uh, that was, was to me really enlightening, things that I never would have considered. Uh, for example, the fact that we provide transportation to the senior center. Uh, the perception is that the folks that use the senior center, if they're using transportation, they're old and they're frail. So that's pretty much the market that we're serving. So it, it almost read like 
providing transportation was a negative uh, in their in their mind. So that was just one thing that, that struck me. And then there was another uh, participant that made a comment about value. And she said, you know, the Groton Senior Center, there's no value to her in hearing that name. But if you threw in like health and wellness or something like that, then there's a value. They under, there's a perceived value with uh, the naming of a building and what goes on there if there's a focus on health and wellness. So uh, it, clearly, we need to do a better job of marketing. Um, what that is and how that looks, um, you know, that's what we're going to have to figure out. We're currently on Facebook doing frequent posts. Um, we're, you know, Instagram. There's a regional website, uh, but clearly that's not enough, and we've got to sit down and figure out exactly it is uh, what additionally we have to do. Thank you. Do any councillors have questions? Councillor Bordelon Zapari. Um, thank you for this information. It's really interesting to take a look at this. Um, I, I do agree. I think the name senior is kind of outdated in a lot of things. Um, even looking at the, the American disability, and you look at like the handicap symbol, it's now someone propelling themselves, moving mm. forward, not yeah. just sitting in a chair waiting for someone to push them. Right. So I think that word senior, because you know, as I've hit 40 myself now, <gasps> thinking that this center accommodates 55-year-olds, that's only 15 years away from me, and I, you know, I think that word in walking in there, it does probably, you know, mm. it would help. I think it would definitely help to. You know, change the name that you're, you know, that the word seniors are doing a lot more than they ever have before. Right. And um, so it will be interesting to see what you guys do with this. I hope you keep us in the loop. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Councillor Zapari. I, I, I kind of like it being called a senior center. We have all kinds of ballparks for kids. We have a community center. We have other things for the younger people. We even have a skating rink. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to see us try to draw seniors into a more active and communicative uh, level. Uh, and I think that, that, that the Senior Center does that. I think that you, you do have to publicize it better, but I would not like to indicate that it's a one size fits all. Uh, you can open activities that the Senior Center is offering to younger people but you ought to emphasize that you want to serve that segment of our population that no longer can play baseball, no longer can roller skate, uh, whose horizons are shrinking. And you're doing that. You send, you send vehicles out to pick them up and bring them in. Uh, and I, by changing the name, I'm afraid you might change the focus. And the seniors, again, will be overwhelmed by people who can do more. Um, I notice when I go on a cruise, there's, if there's a swimming pool and there are kids on the, on the cruise, I can't go in that swimming pool. Yeah. And some of the cruise ships have said, no kids in this swimming pool. It's the smallest swimming pool someplace else, but you, yeah. older folks can get into it. But adults can't get into a swimming pool when there are kids playing in it. Right. And they should play in a swimming pool. But I just like not like to make this, the senior center be the swimming pool. I liked it to be something that uh, that we do attract older people to. And the, the patrons that are using the senior center now have made that abundantly clear yeah. that there is no interest in, in having a grandmom and tot program, uh, you know, there. And, and so our focus will continue to be to serve those 55 plus. Yeah. Um, but I, I think in the future there's gonna be a discussion about, the, about what value people get from using that building and, and so that may change, the, it could potentially change the title of the building. And Correct me if I'm wrong, isn't yeah. there also some federal funding for senior centers for that very reason that they direct their attention to older people? We do a program through Title III. Oops. We do a program through Title III, but only that program is designed for people um, 65 and up. We allow people, if we don't fill the class, 
that are younger to participate, but they pay a fee. You know, but I think initially things were started with grants that were federal, but we don't have any anymore. And our, our goal in including folks that are younger, uh, I'm 58, so I'm gonna say somebody that's 45. Uh, we encourage those folks to participate in, in those programs so that when they get to the point where you know, they're eligible to partake in a lot of the programs and services, it, the, for them it's, it's not that big of a step because they've already, well, I've already taken jazzercise or I've already done this. I've been taking classes there over the years, so for me to go there now, it, it, because I'm senior eligible is, is, not, a, is not a big deal. So we're, we've been working on that over the, over the last few years and, and had some success with that, uh, particularly in, our, in more of our evening programs, uh, having folks that are you know, mid-40s, under 50, uh, still the focus is on 55 plus, but we've seen that typically those evening programs, <coughs> registration doesn't fill with somebody that's 55 and over. So in order for us to increase participation, we've opened it up to uh, folks that are younger. Okay, we have Councilor Obrey and Franco. I'm wondering, in the survey, did you do any numbers on the age of people that are participating? Um. Yeah, on the respondents now. Okay, shot just point out the page, and I'll I'll get stop being the dummy here. <laughs> Slide well, the eight. Point I believe we have the age of respondents, not necessarily those who do participate. Yeah. But I believe in we have a comprehensive analysis of both the qualitative and quantitative reports. This is more of a consolidation of the two. I believe we have those findings in that. Okay. Um, I think that in some aspects it's absolutely wonderful what happens and then in other aspects I think it's really underused. And I'm an advocate for a name change. Uh, you know, because you change the name doesn't mean it's going to open it up to kids. You know, it could be an adult community center. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's probably a much better word than, than that. But I think it needs to be changed so that more people would be apt to walk in or go online and see what's being offered. Mm -hmm. uh, the senior notation just, it takes it to 65. It's not even 55, it takes it to 65. You got 10 years of, of space here that people don't even use it because they just don't think that they're, it's for their time of life. Right, like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so stay out of there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, so I, I really advocate for a, a different name and a good push to try to, you know, maybe those programs would probably have to be evening programs because people that, that are 55 to 65 are still working. Mm -hmm. There's uh, many over, over 65 now. But that, to me, is the group that you need to reach out to. And with evening programs and really getting the word out that this is for anybody um, it, as an adult to come and participate in, I think you'd see a, a great addition to the use. And I, I hope that you'll really go that way. Councilor Franco. Um, I can completely agree with you because Ooh. as I'm getting older, I don't think of myself as as old as I am. <laughs> and I don't like thinking of it that way because I actually feel like I'm a much younger number. Um, so, in here, it has potential for trial rates and open house events. And it states here, when prompted to indicate if discounted trial rates would influence potential users and participation. So my, current, my question is, like, what is the cost then? If, is there a special cost if you're like 55, 65? Is there a different cost when you're older? Because I haven't used the facility because I'm not allowed to yet. So. <laughs> How, Franker. No. Franker. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> but I will tell you, I go to so many meetings up there that there are so many good things that are happening that I can't wait to actually be able to use it. And when I see that there, they have like a barber there, they yeah. have like um, like a nurse area, they have right. like anytime I go up there for things, there's people are working out, and you can see them in the window when you're walking by, and they're yeah. 
And I, I just think it's a wonderful, absolutely wonderful place, but I'm usually going for a meeting, so I don't, I participate usually in some of the events that happen there that right. are open to the whole, full public. Yeah. So, but anyway, so what, is the, what, are, what are they talking about, maybe a discounted trial rate? What is that implying? Well, I think what they mean is that um, if you wanted, if you hadn't been a participant before, we could perhaps offer a discounted rate uh, to get you in the door. Because like the study has shown, that once you get in the door, you get familiar with the programs and services, the satisfaction rate is 99.5%. So do, do you pay like an annual fee or no, is it per so class? No, it, so it's or? a per class fee. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the options might be to offer some kind of a, um, a card where they could take one or two different types of classes to figure out what they enjoy. Because we offer a, a great number of health and wellness programs. And so maybe we give them some kind of a, you know, you can take one of these classes, you can take one of these classes, figure out what you like. Um, the, the program fees are not based on age. Uh, they're based on what residency or non-residency. Okay. Uh, so there's no, you, you know, you don't pay more if you're 55 to 65 and then pay less as you get older. Oh, that's that's I, not the case. I, had, I had, just from my viewpoint, I had seen signs that are like join the 55 club or. 55. Yeah, so I that's. I didn't know if that was like a special. That's. Um, that's a kind of a group within the senior center. Not all members, uh, uh, not all participants in the senior center are members of the 55 club. Uh, that's more of a club that um, they actually collect dues and then a lot of that money comes back into the community. They make donations uh, to human services for fuel assistance. They make, uh, every year they, I think last year they did three, was it $750 grants for, uh, yeah. Graduating uh, seniors from Groton, so it, it's a kind of a community service organization within the senior center. I see, and and just because I'm not knowledgeable on this, and this is more your ex your <coughs> professional experience, the marketing more, especially in digital. What like is there an age where like certain people just aren't paying attention to digital? Actually, they use cell phones and tablets, I think, more than the kids because they're always on their phones. They know how to use it. This is how they communicate. It is the younger seniors, probably through age 70, that are really on the cell phones. But now that it's kind of ingrained and they have grandkids on them, they are all using them. We actually had to boost our power for Wi-Fi <laughs> because so many people were using their cell phones within the building. Mm. And I mean, we get an average of 325 people a day, if not more, for classes and programs. So they're, they're into the digital. They all want to know how to use a tablet. We do programs in our technology center really just keeping them up to date. And they do better than I do on my phone, so I don't have the time. <laughs> so digital marketing may be a good thing to do. I'll send you my wife. <laughs> I, have, I have told people to go to those classes as well that are seniors. And it's really funny because in the focus group, they said they wanted digital, but then some of the people when asked how do you get your information are going, the newspaper. So I think it's, a, it's still a combination for any age, that some get it from the TV, some get it from digital, some get it from newspapers. And I think, if I can just jump in, one thing to keep in mind with that is that as time goes on, more and more people are gonna be using digital mm -hmm. who are not maybe seniors now, but people who are 45, 50, yeah. and on their way to using the senior center. <laughs> that, these are people who are in the so, so it's only growing. <laughs> All as, right. As we move Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Bordelon. Um, yeah, I, once again, I was just thinking about the name change thing as we were discussing. Even if the senior center stays, like Joe uh, 
Councilor Zapiri stated, like having that senior, you know, identifying, it might be just like a little slogan that maybe takes the lead and then Groton Senior mm. Center. So like growing, growing with Groton, Groton Senior Center. Right. Where the, the, the heading takes the lead and so it's more like, you know, not just, and the Senior Center is more in small letters. Right. Um, right. I just a thought I had, you could maybe still keep the Groton Senior Center, but then mm. just use a, a stronger heading to, to lead the way and then make the Groton Senior Center smaller. Um, but looking at the rates that just was brought up, um, it seems to me thinking about the aging population and speaking of the people that are going to be coming seniors that are not having the accessibility to pensions and things like some of our older generations, the cost, I think it should be more on a sliding scale. I think of widowed women and men um, that live alone on fixed incomes that um, a $40 program for them is a week of groceries. But for that 55-year-old working senior or 65-year-old who's sitting pretty on a nice pension or family assets might think that program is nothing. Um, so is there any initiative to, I know um, for the Groton Parks and Rec non-senior programs, some people can apply for financial need. Is there any waiver or anything like that for people that way you're not boxing out a whole population that are being underserviced because they can't step foot in because they don't have the money? Yes. So yeah. Do you wanna... we have a lot of programs that are eight dollars for mm -hmm. you know eight right. weeks. Um, a lot of free programs right. that are available. If a person comes to us, and we pretty well know the population that currently comes, um, we do work with them on on helping them afford the programs. But um, we run the classes at a fairly <coughs> low price. We haven't changed the prices right. in years, um, probably since we moved back into the new center, yeah. trying to keep, again, it low. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to get more people in the classes to keep the prices low. Right. I guess my concern is that you know someone who's got a $50,000 salary and someone who's barely getting by with like 20000 that eight dollars is still a big difference for that two popu the both populations. So I'm just um, versus like someone having to disclose their their financial income and kind of knowing that population versus having a formal process because some people probably don't feel comfortable identifying <coughs> as a need, um, and so having a discrete way for one to be able to apply and access those services that are needed, but to, don't have to disclose their financial mm. need fully like to just people like maybe an online sure. application process yeah. where they can submit supporting documents, looking towards that. And I appreciate that you're keeping the costs low, but once again, for somebody who's on a certain income, $8 is one thing, 40 is another. Um, and they might be able to, um, what I see is populations that just working in the medical field and seeing some people that could come in, the accessibility, you know, they might not have any loved ones in the area or family, and therefore they might need a program three or four nights a week. So for them, that bill might be $100, right? Well, they might not be able to afford that $100 because, uh, but they need the socialization and the exposure and the community that it would provide. So having the ability to uh, discreetly, uh, maybe they have a medical condition, a, a recent diagnosis that's depleted their funds, and have a way that they can discreetly disclose their financial need and be able to utilize more services to open up to, to really hit those people that need that program that can't afford a gym outside anywhere else or anything like that. I'm just a thought, I'm just, and I think that would be, um, doable, I understand the cost, and I appreciate that you're keeping it low, but just looking at all of the, all the demographics in Groton being served. Mm -hmm. Councilor Thank Melendez. Uh, I think Councilor Obrey made a good point in that a lot of people think of senior as 65 plus or 62 plus. Right. So I think um, you guys said you had a 55 plus club? We do, yes. Okay, I think that, like having the number 55 in the, in the name of the mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm maybe 55 Club being the name of the building would be a good name or something else. But, but uh, just, you know, making mm -hmm. it more, you know, that everybody knows it's 55. Yeah, th yeah, this is not a struggle that's unique to Groton. Um, <laughs> if we came up with the perfect name, Mary Jo and I would be rich mm -hmm. because <laughs> all of the senior centers across the country struggle with the same thing. And, and there's been a, a, a number of centers that uh, have you know delved into changing their name. Okay, Councillor Obrey, and then we'll wrap up. 
Okay. I'm just going to suggest that maybe what you might think about that would be kind of fun, but it would probably get you a lot of exposure, is if you did a survey for a new name and asked the schools to participate so you got young people thinking about it. But, you know, really open it up to the public, and then we would have more people thinking about what's really there. Yeah. And I'm sure that we'd probably come up with something pretty interesting. We so have to find a good... For what it's uh, worth, I think it would be something worth pursuing. Yeah, we'd have to find a good company that does surveys. <laughs> yeah. Beg your pardon? We'd have to find a good company that does surveys. Perhaps it could be done in yeah. <laughs> Well, we thank you very much, and we look forward to hearing what you all decide to do with the results of the survey. Thank you very much for coming out. All right, we are on to item 2019-7831. And this is on page 21. I believe we're on Councillor Parker. Yes. <coughs> yep, we're ready. Resolution authorizing the Board of Education to file an application with the state for a reimbursement grant for asbestos work at the Groton Public Schools High School. Whereas the town of the town council must authorize the Board of Education to apply for a grant to receive partial reimbursement for the removal of asbestos at the Groton Public Schools High School. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the town council establishes the Groton Permanent School Building Committee as the building committee for the high school asbestos removal project, authorizes the filing of the application along with any other required paperwork I so move. Second. Second. Moved by Parker. Everyone's eager. <laughs> Seconded by Bumgarner. And uh, we have discussed these items at length in Committee of the Whole. So seeing no further discussion, I will call for a vote on 2019-783 Building Committee High School Asbestos Project. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? So moved unanimously. Thank you. We are on to item 10D, 2019-7951, Assistant Assessor Job Description on page 22. Councilor Franco, please. Make a resolution approving the revision of the assistant assessor's job description. Whereas the assistant assessor's position was vacated by a resignation, and whereas the position of assistant assessor <coughs> has evolved in its responsibilities over time, and whereas the appointment appointed candidate will be trained as in the prescribed revised job description with all the efficiencies that accompany these charges, and whereas approval is recommended by the town's management staff Therefore, be it resolved, the Town Council hereby approves the revision of the Assistant Assessor's job description. I so move. Second. Moved by Franco and seconded by Zaperi. Once again, we've discussed this in committee. Seeing no further discussion. All those in favor of 2019-795 Assistant Assessor job description, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? So moved unanimously. And what we have been waiting for. Um, 10E 2018 2246 adoption of an ordinance to regulate single use plastics and polystyrene food service on page 25. Councillor Heed, it's like it's karma. Mm -hmm. I'll make resolution to adopt an ordinance to regulate single use plastics and polystyrene and food service establishments. Whereas the town of Groton believes that single use plastics and polystyrene food service products negatively impact our community by creating potential health issues for its residents litter on our roadways, pollution in our waterways and coastline, and endangerment to wildlife. And whereas the Town Council directed the Conservation Commission and the Office of Planning and Development Services to research the topic and hold an educational public forum to increase public awareness. And whereas on September 26, 2019, uh, the town held an informational public forum to provide information and gather input. And whereas the Committee of the Whole at their October 22, 2019 regular meeting reviewed input from the education forum and directed the Office of Planning and Development Services to draft the ordinance to regulate the use of single-use plastics and polystyrene food service products. And whereas the town council conducted a public hearing on November 19th, 2019 to solicit public input regarding the proposed ordinance to regulate single-use plastic and polystyrene food service products. And whereas the Committee of the Whole at their December 10, 2019 special meeting voted to adopt the ordinance and minor text changes, now therefore be it resolved, the Town Council adopts an ordinance to regulate single-use plastics and polystyrene food service products, I so move. Second. 
Moved by Heed, seconded by Bumgardner. Um, just a message, I was just informed that the feed is no longer live. Um, is the videographer here? Yeah, he can't control it. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so we have discussed this at great length as well. I'm not sure if anybody wanted to um, make any motion this evening. Councilor Zapari. I'd like to point out that we have discussed this at length. We've had several presentations pointing out the importance of this before the council and before at the time of a public hearing where everyone was invited to, to uh, give their opinions. And at the public hearing, the response to this was overwhelmingly in favor of this ordinance. So I, I, I don't think we need to argue it anymore. I think uh, um, we should go ahead. Councilor Franco? I'd like to make an motion to amend the description of polystyrene. Can you give us a page number and paragraph where you're going, please? That is our packet, page number 27. The paragraph at the, the very last paragraph, remove the word extruded. And, and we're also going to have the word can you give list. The, can you give the, uh, what section this is? The last paragraph on page 27 in our packet. Article First seven, sentence. No, she wants like Article 7, Section 10 193 definitions. She needs to report that one. 10 193 definitions. And um, Councilor Franco is on the definition of the word polystyrene. Yes. And can you just state one more time for the record what, what you're looking to have her do? I would like to remove the word extruded. And before you finish, Mr. Burt had a comment before yes, you finish your also, motion. Also remove the word where it comes the following page on page 28 where it says polystyrene food service product. Remove the word lid. Lids. Lids. Is there a second? I second. Can I speak on it? Let me just write this down and okay. make sure the clerk is ready. So we're moving extruded and removing lids. And that was seconded by Obrey. Yes. Moved by Franco, seconded by Obrey. Councilor Franco, you wish to speak on this as well? Yes, I just want to make a note that when we have had all of our discussions on town council. Um, solid foams, which could be, or solid polystyrene, could be like a hard plastic, and lids were not something that we were looking to ban, or something in our dis was never discussed. And this is more or less um, taking it out so it won't be confusing. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this? Councilor Zapari and then Obrey. I think lids are a form of polystyrene <laughs> that get into the waste cycle and should be precluded. Additionally, lids, the polystyrene lids are a safety hazard because they're, uh, they become a part of the structure of the, the cup holding the, the liquid so that when you squeeze the top of the cup, the polystyrene lid resists the compression. I've had, in, in my practice of law, I can't give you any more details than this, but I've had two cases where one person holding the cup by the lid, suddenly the cup deformed and the, the cup spilled on another person causing scalding burns. The reason for that is that the heat of the coffee in the, uh, in the uh, cup actually softens the polystyrene lid so that it's no longer structurally intact for retaining the shape of the cup. And when the cup deforms, then it will slip out of a person's hand. That's not why we've en enacted this ordinance. We've enacted this ordinance to limit the stream of, uh, of plastics that is polluting our environment. And I think that we should uh, we, I, 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 as I said before, I think we should go beyond what we've done, not go backwards. So the, the polystyrene we want to keep out of the environment. Polystyrene lids for cups are actually unsafe, 
and uh, I, I, uh, I think we should leave the lids in. I'm not too crazy about uh, removing extruded polystyrene if it's extruded, however it's made, and it's made into vessels that we specifically say we don't want to have in the, uh, I think we should just leave this, the, this ordinance as it's written. Thank you, Councilor Obrey. Um, I acknowledge Joe's uh, knowledge of, of these things, but this was one thing that was specifically spoken to us by the business owners. And since we didn't have a uh, discussion about it in depth before, I think this will bring us back to this ordinance to review it in a way that I hope it goes on in the future. So I would agree with making these changes. As I say, I hope we're gonna be reviewing this. I hope we're gonna be looking at it. I hope we're gonna be making it grow. But at this time, I think that this would be best done. I'm withdrawing my friendship to you. <laughs> are there any? Are there any other um, comments, <coughs> Councilor Heat? I'm sorry, I did have you written I down. I apologize, Councilor Heat. So I, I normally I would be, you know, in, in favor, uh, as as Councilor Perry has indicated, of keeping the extruded polystyrene on, uh, but it has been mentioned again by by a specific business that there currently are no alternatives available through their their stream. Uh, may or may not be true we'll find out over the next year that's something that we should find we should look into um, but i want to be careful that we don't that we start the ball rolling and that we not go beyond the capacity of businesses to adapt um, because again we can't save the world we're just starting the process of changing behavior um, so i'll support that change anyone else okay I had my hand up. so I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. see you. Yeah. Councilor Bordelon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think this is a great platform. I think it's something that needs to be done. As I stated, it's important. Um, I do know that um, I'd have to go back and look at some of the notes, but I know other states and towns that have banned it have banned it altogether, and they are adapting. So I'm interested to figure out, which I haven't been able to do the research while I'm here, um, how the other franchises are doing it in other states, um, maybe the, the whole polystyrene solid is not being banned, and I, I guess I'd have to look to see. Does that, it, um, I was wondering if, if we could ask the conservation if they know if that is being, like, I know Cape Cod, there's towns where all of this is banned, and McDonald's didn't shut down, and neither did any of the other businesses, so. Would you please come up, Mr. Dunn? He raised Just, his hand to volunteer to, oh, to answer, so thank you very much. Or Mr. DeStante, or Ms. DeStante, I'm sorry. I, I think you asked several questions. Yeah. The first one is, are there alternatives? Uh, and the answer is yes. Right. The question of are there uh, currently alternatives in the McDonald's distribution system, which mm -hmm. is a closed system, the answer is no, but, you know, the, the franchisee is certainly free to use other sources for those lids, and which is what happens, because the McDonald's can't force the franchisee to violate an ordinance. So you know, there are ways of getting around it, as I mentioned earlier. There is an increase in cost of about three cents, about, right, you know, for, for, per lid. But again, you get, you know, a, a bit more structurally sound lid out of it. So that was one question I heard. Is that? That's pretty much it. And then so the other ordinance that you have seen, um, the polystyrene, is it also removing the solid form that people are yeah. talking about in the lids? <laughs> More difficult to answer because there's, it's <laughs> not as clear as some of the other things that are in the mm -hmm. ordinance. Yeah. So, you know, you looked at California's like the, the, the bellwether right. of some of the stuff. They've had trouble getting the styrene in. Number one is there's so many different definitions and, yeah. and chemical uh, compounds for styrene. And I think the, the intent of the ordinance was the foam Correct. style, yeah. not the, let's call it the, the hard, thick um, uh, material that's there. So I think 
And what I said earlier was, it should, we should probably, or you should probably get a little bit crisper definition so people aren't confused, you know, in terms of definition of foam, but I, I would say that the staff could, could kind of clarify that. Because when I, I keep reading it, and I read it again several times as I was sitting here, yeah. and it said, you know, that there really is only foam-related products, irrespective of how it was manufactured. Um, but I think it's, if it's not clear to us, it wasn't clear to me when I quickly read it, it'll be confusing to everyone else. So I would suggest that you, you know, do what you do, it's clarify what exactly products are excluded so that there's no misunderstanding. That would be part of the education Correct. Uh, to the businesses and establishments which would follow the passage of an ordinance. Correct, so, yeah. so we, counted on, we counted on your judgment to guide us with this before and I think if um, they're telling us now that um, they are even looking for some clarity, perhaps um, the amendment would be wise to do at this point. Uh, Mr. Stunt. Can I just add in, um, yes, I please. know in, for example, California, this, it's all been banned, and they use, um, they have cornstarch um, uh, products, and they also are comp uh, industrially composted, so, so there's no products that are plastic or polystyrene based. Also, the state of Maine, as I understand it, has completely banned all polystyrene products, and uh, the EU is going single-use plastic free in 2021, the whole EU. So this can be done, and I think if there's an ordinance in place, that's gonna push businesses to find, that the alternatives are there, it's just not convenient for them and they don't want to. Um, it's gonna cost a little more, charge a little more for the product. You know, there's, a Star there's some Starbucks out in California now, I believe they're going cup free. Like, you can have coffee, but you can't have a cup. You have to bring your own cup, and they're piloting that. So if a company like Starbucks, Starbucks can push the envelope forward, you know, these, these other companies that are reluctant, they're gonna be dragged along, but it can be done, you know. So are, are there any counselors who haven't spoken yet that wish to speak on this, because Councilor Franco wanted to talk again? Okay, go ahead. I would just like to say, I, I understand there's all types of replacements, and but the intent when this was brought forward was not to do anything with lids. We never discussed lids. We talked about styrofoam as in the fluffy, squishy styrofoam, like in a takeout container, in a clamshell. And it, I believe it was even me who said I would like this polystyrene in there um, when it wasn't an original listed item. Um, but as a lid that is more of a harder plastic type of feel, that is not something that, as you were saying, the intent of what we brought this forward for. We picked certain items that we had all agreed upon, and lids was not even in that discussion. And as it is listed in here as a polystyrene food service product, when it said <coughs> lids, in my mind, I was thinking of a takeout container, not a cup lid. I was thinking as a something that would go on top of like a clamshell covering. Um, so I think if we remove the word lids, do you, can you tell me if we remove the, the word extruded and then remove the word lids from the food service products, that would basically. Well, I mean, Technically, if you just remove the word lids, you wouldn't have to worry about extruded because how you created it is inferior. Can you give me a definition of what the difference is between blown polystyrene, expanded, and extruded foam? In the context of the ordinance as written, there are mechanisms to create the foam <coughs> type of styrene, not the, the, the more dense uh, product. That's what I'm saying is that you gotta really look at it and really read the, each word carefully and what the intent, and I agree with you, what I heard the discussions was more on the foam, you know, the high volume types of styrene, not the uh, many other types of styrene that, that are, are more hard uh, plastic. And you know, medical equipment, a lot of things are made with that because it has some properties that actually help uh, because they're, they can be, uh, uh, you know, sterilize and other things. So 
there's, there's this big range of products. That's what I'm saying. Is by removing lid might be the more effective way of saying, or even say, as exclusion lids, and they'll kind of do the, the, the reverse of that. Uh, so, so there's no misunderstanding of the types of products. Or maybe an addendum that would say, here's some examples of the, of the products that, are, that aren't in the ordinance, but are provided as part of the education. So I'm going to jump in just to try to clarify where we are with things. We, we have this, this dead horse we have gone over so many times, and we were all agree that we were ready to do this. We, we had a consensus. I shouldn't say all agreed. We had a consensus to move ahead with this. So tonight we're, we're at kind of a crossroads here. And we can do one of two things, ideally, pass it as it is. But as Councillor Heed said, pragmatically, um, is it going to go through if we leave it as it is? Because I feel we may lose some votes. So what do we want to do? Do we want to try to accommodate the person who came in at the last minute and said to us, we have a problem, this is going to cost us some money, and do that by simply taking out one or two words? Or do we want to try to get this through as it's written and um, run the risk. So um, I ask you to think about that uh, before we go on any further. We have worked really hard on this. A lot of people have worked really hard on this. And, uh, and again, ideally, um, it would go through as written. Uh, that, if it was my choice, it would go through as written and perhaps even with a few more things thrown in. Um, ideally, I don't think that's gonna happen tonight. So please consider whether you are prepared to um, do a little bit of a give at this point and be pragmatic about this so we can get this passed this evening. And people who haven't spoken yet, I will go to next. So is there anyone else who hasn't spoken yet that would like to speak? Okay, so we are, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Baumgartner. Yeah, and I, I'd like to remind the council that we've already um, have discussed uh, adding additional items throughout this process and we've removed several items including uh, the styrofoam coolers um, that was uh, they there wasn't in. a consensus they were, they were never they were never in I was saying there wasn't a consensus on the council yeah. to support a ban on that product well they weren't in that's the mm -hmm. important thing okay but so I, go ahead sorry. finish finish what you're and, and since is. actually um, since since we had that discussion, Igloo announced that they were um, doing away with the uh, styrofoam uh, cooler, uh, and it will include uh, uh, no polystyrene. So I just wanted to get that on the record. Any other counselors who have not spoken yet? Um, Councilor Overy, did you speak on this already? I have you down here, but I don't remember if you did. I don't think so. Councilor Overy. Maybe I did. I don't know. Yeah, you did. You did. You did? I okay. did. Yeah. Councilor, oh, Councilor Melendez or oh, Councilor wait. Parker have not spoken yet. Do either of you wish to speak before we go to second time? Okay, Councilor Obrey and then Bordelon. Okay. Um, we have worked hard on this, but one thing I want to I want to I want to correct the man. The people that spoke tonight on the uh, problem with the lids are not just in. They've been here. They've been talking with us. So I'd like to correct that. I take exception. It was McDonald's that brought the lids up tonight, not, not the other company. Well, the, there have been other people here. I think this is a point of compromise. You know, I, I know what we're doing is good, but we also have to take care of the people that have businesses in this town. I think I mentioned it before. I will mention it again. You'd be amazed at what can make a small business go out of business. I had a car wash. The state decided they were gonna put a tax on every car that went through the car wash. That was one of the ends of our business. And that's not a lot of money, but when you add it up and you can't raise your prices, there you are. And that's not being taken into this consideration. These things will work out. We will come back to this, but tonight to make a small compromise that I think at least makes these people know that we're thinking about them and we want them to stay an active business in this town. This is a very small compromise. And I think it's time for all of us to compromise. Not just keep pushing our own ideas, but think about beyond the bigger good that we're doing by what we're trying to pass, look at the other side of it and for a very small item we can work with this 
and come back to it and see if people are ready at that point because their corporations have gotten behind it that are being forced to do it by somebody like maybe California where they have made very radical changes. We're not quite ready there for that, that ultimate thing. And I would ask you all to consider the fact that we, we do have business people that came in here and said what a hardship it was going to create. We can't ignore that. We want our businesses to stay in this town. And I, I'm sure you've all had your own businesses. Maybe you were sat in a position where you had to look at your budget and fi fi figure things out. But you know, somehow I'm not thinking maybe that's the case, that you had small businesses. Small businesses are an entity all to themselves, and they're tough. And I think we need to do this for those small businesses. Councilor Gordon. So I, I think it's appropriate to make sure we, we don't want to pass something through as written as was stated without it properly being able to be enforced and clarified to the user to be able to read it. So as I would like a more intense, tensive, ordinance than this down the road, and this is a, like a platform, but the platform has to be readable and be able to be enforced. So for example, we talked about the lids now. So then one would then ask, would a polystyrene container, that's the hard plastic, which I just got one the other day from a shop. I looked up the numbers and everything online and it was a polystyrene container, not the soft, spongy styrene. Under this ordinance, would that be banned? That's single use, right? But but just so people understand that it's what form is it in? You know what I mean? And and so as it's written, that's a styrene container. Adding the lid, it, I don't know. It's just I just worry that it's um, I I don't know. I'm just worried about the wording. So to clarify, are you in favor of the amendment? I, I, I'm, I'm willing to negotiate and work with the whole council and obviously to work with everyone to get something through tonight. I'd like something to go through. But just saying we should push it through because as written without the concerns that uh, Councillor Franco has brought up and Councillor Obrey has stated for clarification on the purpose was never the lids, so I thought, um, either. I just want to make sure that we're not doing something and we had the public comment when we discussed that it was more of the squishy foam and now it seems as you read more some are reading it different two different ways so that's where I'm supporting the two counselors for the clarification part making sure that we have to have something that we can start from but you have to be able to abide by it as well I don't think anyone's arguing that point perhaps counselors of Perry but anyone else <laughs> Well, well, he, he, well was, with all due he was respect, looking, with excuse all due me, respect. I have the floor right now. I was um, Councilors of Perry um, had originally said he would like the original um, ordinance to go through. Um, and he's the only one I've heard so far that has verbalized that. So, um, well, I, are there I any other I was still talking, maybe I misunderstood you then. I thought you I had said you, you wanted yes. it to go through in its No, form I think you or, did misunderstand. Okay. Counselor, okay. Councilor Zapera. I, you know, I appreciate the desire to be, to be compromising and to accommodate the interests of some of our constituents who, uh, who will, you know, the, the, I, I just can't see that it's a major major financial impairment to them. But there is a compelling urgency to taking action to limit styrofoam and other uh, plastics in the waste stream. And I don't think we have time to fart around arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of the pin or whose profits are being gouged and how we want to encourage businesses we have a responsibility to the environment, and the environment is for, the, for all the people, the people of Groton and for all the people. And I think that we should make that our priority concern at this time because we have stuck our heads in the sand for so long that this has risen to such a monumental problem. Uh, and we've heard it over and over again with the presentations we've had from the Conservation Commission. Uh, I don't think we can water it down. And as I said before, we've got to beef it up. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think we have to look at 
the big picture, as you say, and, and worry about whether or not there will be uh, a place for our children uh, on this planet. So, Madam Clerk, um, given that there is an amendment on the floor, will we be voting first on the amendment? Amen. And then if the amendment fails, then we go back to the whole ordinance. Correct. Okay. Um, Councilor Heed. Um, okay, so based on uh, what I've heard from uh, Councilor um, Bordelon, it seems like if we eliminate the extruded polystyrene uh, and lids together, mm -hmm. we actually could create an unintended consequence of allowing polystyrene, extruded polystyrene cups from getting through the ordinance, uh, which creates an issue of, uh, and then of course, uh, you have both indicated that there are uh, alternative lids available that um, McDonald's in particular would be able to order outside of uh, their McDonald's um, supply chain, uh, which they apparently are able to do. Um, so one of two things I think is uh, uh, to do an, an additional amendment to say on, uh, poly, on the polystyrene uh, food service product where you uh, eliminate the lids. Instead of eliminating lids or polystyrene, uh, under the final sentence does not include polystyrene coolers, egg cartons, or cutlery. A uh, motion could be made to say or extrude a polystyrene lids uh, so that it's specific right. to those lids. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. I'm not making a motion. I'm okay. just suggesting right. um, that it could be a motion to say to add after cutlery extruded polystyrene lids so that it's specific to the lids. Um, but if it's available outside of the McDonald's would be able to purchase it, uh, then I see no reason to change it. So, so you're not making a motion. I'm not at this making a motion, but I would say if we were going to make a motion, that would be the motion that yeah. should be made. Other people haven't spoken yet. Councilor Parker. Okay. I'm just going to put it out there. I am not for this. I don't think we did enough research on this. I did not think we did enough education on this. I do not think we talked to enough businesses about it. I do not feel comfortable putting this through. I'm just putting that out there. Where. Now getting knit in the nitty gritty, this business has reached out to us who is probably part of a corporation who has to use the stuff that is through their, when they bought, order supplies, they have to purchase it. If it's a franchise, those are separate. They can do stuff individually on their own and get different supplies. When it's a corporation, because I worked for McDonald's a long time ago, under a corporation, you have to order certain things from their company and their supplier. So when a business comes out and a couple of businesses come out and talk to us or emailed us, I think we should try to listen. We're trying to be business friendly and I do not see us being business friendly. We're trying to get other businesses to come here to go out and to boost our economic development. How are we going to do that if we're restricting so much? We have to give a little bit. But as it is, I'd rather have removed the words and then go forward if you guys want to do it that way. But other than that, I'm actually not for this at this time because I, I don't think we've done enough. So you favor the amendment, but not necessarily the overall ordinance. Oh, I'm just I trying to clarify correct. where everybody is so that we get a sense of what we're, what we're facing correct. here. Uh, I, this, so I've said, you have to understand where we are with things. Well, I've been saying this from the jump start. I know. So. I get it. I get it. Okay. Um, anybody else who hasn't spoken yet? All right. So then I'm going to call for a vote on the amendment, Councilor Franco's amendment, which strikes the word lids and the word extruded. extruded and this is all in Article 7, Section 10193. So, so I still have a question now. I mm. just called the vote. Just, but I had put my hand up before she said she wanted to speak, so. Go ahead. So I'm still trying to clarify, and, and I'm just gonna, admit, I don't know how to state it any other way. The first sentence where polystyrene means and includes blown polystyrene and expanded and extruded foams. It's the foam word that kind of 
trips it versus the extrusion you know, to get the, the lids. That's, that's why when I reread it, is I think the, the intent as I read it was foam related products, right, in that paragraph. However, you, you create it. So when you're making a hard polystyrene, which is more what I, we're, let's just call the solid. Yep. Is that part of the blown, the expanded, or the extruded? No, in, in my opinion, no. Because you're, you're injecting air and other, you know, you're trying to blow it up and get higher volume versus a, a higher, lower density versus a higher density material. You could think of those three, I, I don't have it in front of me so I can't see it, but I believe those first three terms are adjectives <coughs> to describe the way the foam, foam is, is made. made. So, so it's like, it's, this it's foam that is made this way, this way, or this way. I believe that's how it, what it means. That's foam. Right. So what do you call the solid then? That would be polystyrene, but it's not well, polystyrene. Well, it's polystyrene, but not polystyrene okay. foam. Uh, yes, it's a form, but like I said, there's many, many forms of plastic. I mean, it's a, yeah. That's why it gets difficult and why people get confused. It, it, you need to get pretty clear. So. Um, All right. Thank you. We need, we need so by removing the word lids, I, th I think then we're covered that if we remove lids, that so that would not be banned. your amendment. Do you wish to withdraw your amendment no. and make a new amendment? No, because I think we're removing the You're removing word two words, lids. Though. Yeah. And extruded. Yeah. What is extruded? You, you move yeah. to strike extruded as well. So if you'd like to at this point, um, Councilors Heaton Bumgart, no, Councilors Franco and Obrey, you could withdraw your amendment and make a new amendment if you so choose. So by putting the word extruded foam back in there and removing the word lids, we were back to the, what our intent is, do you believe? I believe so. All right. I'll make a, I would like to rescind my motion. So then the second, is the second rescinded? Okay, so Madam Clerk, are you following along here? So the, the <laughs> amendment has fallen. Councilor like, Franco, I will yield to you if you'd like to make the new amendment. Please, I would and like to make a motion to do an amended and remove the word lids from polystyrene food service products paragraph on section 10-193 definitions remove the word lids is there a second second moved by Franco and seconded by Obrey okay now Councilor Melendez where we are with this is I'm sorry you, is I'm not sure if you were confused about what Mr. Dunn was saying or where we were in the process so do you just want to clarify what um, you were needing what at this we were point? voting on okay that's yeah. what I'm going to do now so right now what's going to happen is we're going to vote on Councilor Franco's amendment which strikes the words lid from that particular section and I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Councilor Franco, the intent is to try to help out the man who um, emailed us today regarding and the lids those. at his okay. establishment. Okay, so question. If yes. we vote yes and it passes, did we pass the ordinance with the amendment or we just amended it? So now you just told me we were having two votes. So, so you're going to vote on this amendment? Right? Yes. And then you vote on the entire ordinance with the amendment, right. as amended. Okay, right. So we have two votes. Correct. So the first okay. one is just to vote whether to accept that's Councilor standard, Franco's that's amendment. Wants to vote and then to if, that, if that passes, mm -hmm. then we go in, we vote the ordinance. If it fails, then we're back to the original ordinance. Okay, correct. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you want to speak, Councilor Bordlon? No, I just want to clear. I just wanted to see the order as well for voting purposes. Um, but... I guess I have trouble because this has been written like this for how long now? For with, a short period of time. Well, with the, with the word lids on it. I mean, it's been, everybody was in agreement, so I, I agree. I don't know. It's. You could read something 16 times. I know. <laughs> okay. I think everyone who wanted to speak has spoken. So um, are you ready to tally votes, Madam Clerk? Yep. So I, I will call for a vote on the amendment which strikes the word 
lids from section 10193 definitions the definition of polystyrene food service product if you are in favor please raise your hand and keep your hand up until counselor or not until the clerk um, acknowledges your vote please Franco Heed Granitowski Obrey and Melendez Oh, I am in favor of it. <laughs> okay. 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 Can, can we do that again, please? I'm sorry. All those in favor of um, Councillor Franco's amendment, please raise your hand and keep your hand up I until the clerk calls your name, please. Parker, Franco, Heed, Granitowski, Obrey, Melendez. So the amendment passes. Yep. So now we vote on the ordinance as amended. Do you want to have it? Oh, can I those know. who I'm are sorry. opposed oh. at least have the opportunity the, the, to say we are? Those who, are opposed opposed. To, okay. those who are opposed to the amendment, please vehemently express your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. That'll be, that'll be Bumgarner, Bordelon, and Sapiri. Thank you. So that amendment passes. So now we are back to, we are to the um, ordinance as amended. All those in favor of the ordinance as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Parker, abstentions? So moved, eight to one. Okay. Thank you, Conservation Commission. Thank you for giving us the opportunity, and we look forward to continuing to work on these issues going forward. And we will definitely call for your help. <laughs> Great, that's, that's reassuring to us, thank you. Um, 2019-797 appointment of town council personnel and appointments committee by mayor. I'm just going to read this one because I need to adjust this. Um, appointment of town council personnel and appointments committee by mayor. The mayor hereby appoints the following members to the personnel and appointments committee for the 32nd town councilor. Council, Councilor Juan Melendez Jr., Councilor Joseph Perry, and Councilor Conrad Heed has graciously agreed to serve again. I so move. Second. 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 Moved by Granitowski, seconded by Parker. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, so moved unanimously. 2019-729, uh, the Great Union Agreement on page 32, and this is Council <coughs> uh, Resolution approving the tentative agreement reached between the town and local 3539, Council number four, AFSCME, comma, AFL-CIO, Groton Employees Administrative Technical and Administrative Specialists. Great. It sounds like Tony the Tiger. <laughs> Your rates for the term July 1st, 2019, June 30th, 2022. Do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. Whereas the Town of Groton and Local 3539 Council Number 4, AFSCME, AFL, CIO, Groton Employees Administrative Technical and Administrative Specialist Greats reached a tentative agreement on successor collective bargaining agreement for the period of July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2022. And whereas the bargaining unit membership voted to approve the agreement and Whereas approval is recommended by the town's negotiators, therefore be it resolved that the Groton Town Council hereby approves the agreement and the expeditions. Expenditure. Oh, I'm sorry? Expenditure. Expenses, uh, whatever, of funds <laughs> necessary to implement the agreement between the town and local 3539 Council Number 4, AFSCME, AFL CIO, Groton Employees Administrative Technical and Administrative Specialist, Gary Eats, on a successor collective bargaining agreement for the period July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2022. I so move. Second. <laughs> Moved by Overy, seconded by Baumgartner. Is there any discussion on this? And again, we've discussed this in Committee of the Whole. No. Seeing none, all those in favor of 2019-729 Greats Union Agreement, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention, so moved unanimously. We are on to 2019-7871 dual language ballots on page 33, Council Bordelon. <coughs> That's appropriate. Resolution directing the usage of dual language ballots in English and in Spanish in the town 
of Groton elections and referendum. Uh, whereas the town of Groton currently uses English language only election ballots, and whereas the town of Groton wishes to better serve and represent the diverse population by including Spanish language instructions on its election ballots, now therefore be it resolved that the town, of Gr the town council directs the town clerk and the registers of voters to use a dual language ballots with Spanish and English in all elections and referendum. Second. Moved by Bordelon, seconded by Baumgartner. Is there, we've discussed this in committee. Um, yeah, we have discussion, okay. Um, I looked this way first, so we'll go Parker, Heed, Baumgartner. Go ahead. Question, I thought we were gonna get pricing first. Did we get pricing on this first? No, um, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, I. I she was going to. That wasn't I, dependent I, on this part right here. No, there was no. Um, issue. I'd rather know what the price is going to be. It has to bring it here. I. It did pass to bring it here, but we also were told we would get pricing, so that by the time it got here, we could right, decide. Right. That I relayed the information. That I, there is no charge. There's no additional fee no, for. No. Adding, no, nope. no only, only if you no have an enormous ballot. You know, if you, if you put six pages, he said, I'll probably charge you a six-page ballot. But that's not contingent on the language. That would be contingent on the, the amount. choice of words Correct. and the amount of words. <coughs> but it's, he's doing, my, my printer, what we use, which is what the state has us use, does ballots now. And he, that's why I, when I had those uh, examples that I gave to you, those were from my printer. And there's no additional charge for that. So if we printed every ballot with dual language, there would be no additional thing. That's what I was told. Thank so you. I had Parker, Heaton, Bumgarner. Did you all have the same question? No? Okay. So Heaton and Bumgarner. This is not directly, I think it probably isn't directly related to passing this tonight, but I would like to know after the election how many people actually take advantage of it because if we go through the process and... No, they're all going to be all ballots. There won't oh, be a ballots. separate ballot. Yes. Every yeah. ballot. Oh, gotcha. Or okay. whole town. It's not a separate ballot. No. no. Yeah, gotcha. That's okay. what's going to be the cost like savings. The hand the Councilor Baumgartner. Gardner. Just on, on the record, I'd like to thank our, our clerk and registrars for the presentation. Yes. Um, initial presentation. I thought it was very thorough, and and um, you know this is very important considering the diversity in our our town. So look forward to supporting it. And the League of Women Voters as well turned out. So. And and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Councilor Bordelon, who uh, started these discussions as a, a new councilor. So. So we have um, one Overy, Bordelon, Zapari. Are we going to continue forward though to get an answer as to whether we can put um, other items that are being voted on actually in the voting? Other miscellaneous items we, into the voting booth, I think, is what you're talking when about. When we have an item that has to be voted on that you actually have to stand there and read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was our, we discussed that the night we were here, and right. there's nothing that prevents someone from bringing something in. You want something posted in, I, I can't believe it would be a problem. I can't right. believe there would be Do a you problem. you double check on that for us? I'll, it, yeah, I'll have to <coughs> I can't believe there'd be a problem, because okay. we have it every, everywhere else, you know. All right. We Council. just talked about it, and I don't think we firmed it up. Well, I, I think that's the Secretary of the State's It, it is on the back of yeah. you know, your Yeah, your but we talked here. about actually putting it right in front of them when they're standing there to vote. Might help. Because a lot of times we don't get a vote from people on separate items that we're asking them to vote on. Okay, we have Councilor Bordelon and Zapari. Um, I just wanted to thank the, the town for looking into this and, and uh, bringing examples forward. Uh, as I had brought this up a year ago as a RTM member, and uh, I think it's it's exciting to see. I think that this brings um, it makes a statement to the, the the town that we live in that we accept everybody, no matter their background, and that we care about their their vote, their right to vote. Um, and so I think it's very important um, that we do that, even though um, other towns are mandated based on the percent that they serve, that we're, we're, being, we're taking the initiative to say that that number doesn't matter to us, we're close enough, and, and we're going to have this available to our, our constituents and, and community. And I think I'm very excited about that. It's passed tonight. Councilor Zapari. Can I move the question? <laughs> is there a you second? Actually, point of order, you can't actually move a question during committee of the whole. <laughs> this is council. 
Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> is there a second to move the question? Second. No one seconds it. It doesn't get voted. She just, she just seconded. So all those in favor of moving the question say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, we are voting on 2019 7871 dual language ballots. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? So moved unanimously. Councilor Melendez, I'm going to hand you this, please. There is one addition that is handwritten in here. There's one term that was left out. Can you read the handwriting up there at the top? If so, right yeah, so if you could just add that when you read, please. Okay. I make a resolution to approve an updated town manager's contract, whereas the town council recently condu conducted a performance evaluation for the town manager resulting in a positive outcome, and whereas the town council desires to make changes to the town manager's contract, now therefore be it resolved that the mayor is authorized to sign an updated contract with the town manager with an effective date of December 29th, 2019 to include the following one one percent merit increase to be added to salary two increasing employer contribution to one thousand five hundred dollars annually for the deferred compensation plan hsa or 529 plan of the town manager's choice three addition of one year on the term of the contract and be it further resolved that the funds to pay for these changes shall come from existing budgets for the remainder of fiscal year ending 2020. I so move. Second. Second. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Obrey. So the change is the addition of the term HSA. So it reads for the Deferred Compensation Plan, HSA, or 529. And that was a request from the manager. All right. Everybody's clear on what the addition is? Gotcha. Yes? OK, very good. <laughs> All right. Um, Councilor Obrey. I was just going to make note that I noticed our <clears throat> town manager was there while they're texting, so I figured he was telling his wife to go buy the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, what is that with 1%? All right. <coughs> Councilor Bordelon. I just wanted to say that um, I've only been on the council a short time, but my interactions with John have been great, and uh, even from the RTM, he attends all those meetings, and I think he puts a lot of heart and soul into this, and uh, I think it's, it's a pr an appropriate um, merit raise and um, I look forward to the extension and more to come. Thanks, John. Very nice job. Anyone else? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of 2019-780 Town Manager Performance Review, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved unanimously. Uh, we are on to other business. Uh, keeping in mind it is 10-15 and we're supposed to vote before we take anything else up, Motion which I to forgot to do. Uh, second. Motion to adjourn, made by Heath, seconded by Parker. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? So I'm unanimous. Oh, I'm sorry. Eight in favor. <laughs> One opposed. Franco? Any abstentions? Seven in favor. <laughs> One opposed. Franco? One abstention. Bordelon? That motion carries. We are adjourned at... 1019. Thank you.